Hallelujah. City of Adelaide Council meeting on Tuesday, 8th of August 2017. The Lord Mayor is in the chair. This council meeting will be streamed live and recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting <laughs> may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the council, including outside of Australia. The red light to my right indicates that the meeting is being filmed and streamed. Council acknowledges that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. <coughs> the Council acknowledges the vision of Colonel William Light in determining the site for Adelaide and the design of the city with its six squares and surrounding belt of continuous parklands, which is recognised on the National Heritage List as one of the greatest examples of Australia's planning heritage. Thank you, CEO. Ladies and gentlemen, members, please sit down. <laughs> Members, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the uh, meeting of the City of Adelaide, Tuesday the 8th of uh, August 2017. Thank you, CEO. Members, I will take you first to uh, item three, which is apologies and leave of absence. We have one leave of absence, which is Deputy Lord Mayor Sandy Vershaw, who is overseas on council business. So I'll take you directly on to confirmation of minutes for meeting held on the 25th of July 2017. Uh, members also noting that there are some inclusions which you have noted on your agenda. Councillor Wilkinson. Moved, seconded by. Councillor Martin, thank you, Councillor. Members, any debate? Summing up, Councillor Wilkinson, I move for those minutes to be adopted. Those in favour? Those against? We carry item four on your agenda, members, thank you. Members, we have five deputations which are registered for this evening's meeting. Uh, before I do commence with those deputations, I just might talk briefly about the order of this evening's meeting, given that we have a number of people who have joined us in the gallery. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to see you. Members, um, item 9.3 I've been advised, which was on your papers as a motion on notice by Councillor Antic has been withdrawn. It will be replaced by a motion without notice on the same matter uh, with changes, which I will bring to your attention for debate uh, directly after the five deputations in the interest of everybody's time in the gallery. So members, without further ado, we will start our deputations. Uh, the first of our deputations, I will call upon Mr. Torben Brookman from the Adelaide Festival to talk about the Adelaide Festival pontoon. Mr Brookman, welcome back to the Council Chamber. And uh, we'll afford you five minutes and the members may then elect to ask you questions. Welcome. Okay. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Thanks, Councillors. Uh, I won't take up too much of your time. Uh, I really just wanted to come uh, and speak to you again this evening just to say that uh, I believe you have a report in front of you with regards to the, the Riverbank pontoon. Uh, I just wanted to confirm that the Adelaide Festival agrees with the, the contents of that report. Um, I also wish to say that um, we have investigated uh, some further activations. Uh, we're going to need some more time to fully flesh those out, um, but we'll continue to do so. But, but what you have in the report gives a taste of, of, of what can be achieved. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to say that uh, the Riverbank Authority of Further today uh, confirmed that they their commitment, I guess, to doing um, a, a summer activation and a winter activation on the pontoon should it be, be there in the, in the river and available for use, um, which is good news for us. Um, lastly, there was an item in the advertiser this morning which you may have seen in relation to the Felmeri group. Um, 
uh, wishing to, to, to purchase the pontoon uh, after a period of time and, and have some other plans for that. Uh, I just wanted to confirm that um, we're not talking about beyond 2018 at this point in time. Uh, the Adelaide Festival's interest is primarily in the next two years of keeping the pontoon in place so that the Riverbank Palais can proceed. Um, but it is a, an indication of the future interest that there is in the pontoon. Um, Finally, it, I would confirm though that, um, and can, can clarify further, but it is the Thelmeri group whom we are talking to in relation to doing the decking and cladding uh, of the pontoon. Um, I'll leave it at that. If there's any questions, happy to answer those. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Booker. Members, do you have any questions, points of clarity? Councillor Moran. Yeah, just a point of clarity. Um, when you're talking about selling the pontoon, sure. um, how could you do that? on public land, what, sell it and then take it away somewhere else, or? Uh, no, look, that's why I'm saying it would, it would be a bigger discussion. Um, if there was a party that was interested in purchasing the pontoon, it would clearly have to be a discussion that was had in conjunction with council and Riverbank Authority upon an agreement for whatever future use that may be. Um, but clearly it's, a, it's an expensive asset. I know, if I know there was use for it in the future, that, that would be something we'd be contemplating. I know this is only points of clarification, sure. but I would cease those discussions immediately. You cannot sell something on public land like that. Well, we can, sell the, we can sell the we can sell the asset wasting, itself, wasting but we. I'm sorry. You're wasting your time, doing okay. Members, I might. Yes. Members, that might become part of the debate. Do we have any further questions to Mr. Bookman? Councillor Abiyad. Just to clarify on Councillor Moran's point, uh, I guess if it does progress down the path where there's a potential sale of the asset, uh, that will not be negotiated without council as the lessee or the lessor of the land. Absolutely not. Giving a tick first or denying the option. Absolutely, no. no the, the asset that's for sale is the, the barge, the pontoon itself. Yep. The use for that would be up to council to decide, absolutely. That's fine. Thank you for clarifying that. Thank you, Councillor Abia. Councillor Martin. Yeah, look, my question related to, uh, to the uh, activation of the barge. Mm -hmm. Our administration tells us in the report tonight that it looks very difficult uh, to negotiate any kind of uh, activations for the balance of this year. Is that your view also? Or? Look, I think by the time we, we need to work through the process of, um, of the development approval process that's, that's required to go through in order to, to complete the cladding. Um, also, the pontoon has to be um, re-engineered to be a permanent, um, semi-permanent uh, for the next two years at least. Um, fixed, just that needs to be completed. Um, we've advised eight to ten weeks to complete the works, which takes us through until later October. If indeed we can get things uh, in there before the end of the year, we absolutely will try to, and that's certainly what we'd like to do, um, and we'll work towards that. But um, they're, they're quite correct. It's challenging with all the works that are currently already uh, in place as well, but, but we'll certainly endeavour to do that. Thank you. Councillor Wilkinson. Um, do you or the Falmeri group have any aspiration to seek of the council in two years' time to leave it in, uh, if it's going well or, or, or for whatever reason? Sure. I mean, I suppose that, that's a hypothetical situation, really. Uh, our primary interest is to keep the pontoon in place for use for the Riverbank Palais for the next two Adelaide festivals and to activate it uh, as efficiently and as, uh, as, as much as possible in the intervening period. So, so you might lobby your council in two years' time to, to keep it in beyond that time? Look, I don't know if there's any point in speculating on it now. Clearly, it, it's a council decision as to whether the, the, um, the barge can remain beyond that period of time. Our interest is primarily in the next two years, the next two Adelaide festivals, and, and providing an asset for the use for the city over that period. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Slama, Councillor Maloney, after. Thank you. Um, just to clarify, so is the recladding of the barge subject to the Formary group purchasing the pontoon? No, it's not. No. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Mullaney, question? <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Um, the, uh, the attachments to our report have um, the sort of designs and then it's also got the um, 
a schedule, a program. Sure. So I haven't, we haven't actually seen a proposed draft lease agreement. Um, I just wonder about maintenance and the um, reassurance around managing the maintenance and schedule of the pontoon. Yeah, uh, look, we would be, the Adelaide Festival will take full responsibility for maintenance of the pontoon. Uh, and because of the, the nature of the cladding that we're proposing, what we would indeed do, and we've discussed with our engineers, is providing uh, multiple access points to uh, get access to the barge that's below the cladding. So there has to be access points created within the cladding to do that. Um, but we certainly have an act, um, a maintenance schedule that, that we'll look at. Yeah. Members, no further questions? Thank you, Mr. Bookman. Thank you very much for your deputation to the City of Adelaide Council Chamber. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Thanks, Councillors. Members, our second deputation this evening is Miss Rachel Scott regarding building upgrade finance. Welcome, Miss Scott. Councillors will afford you five minutes for your deputation and then they may wish to ask you questions. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, right on the board, Lord Mayor and Councillors, thank you for allowing me to address you tonight on building upgrade finance. My name is Rachel Scott and I head up the building upgrade finance team at Eureka Real Assets, a carbon neutral Adelaide founding partner. We've financed around $40 million of these types of agreements to date in New South Wales and Victoria and are excited by the announcement of enactment last week by the South Australian State Government. The City of Adelaide, City of Adelaide Council have been proactively involved in assisting with the implementation of this legislation and as such we would just like to voice our support and answer any questions you may have rather than detail the program itself. This program breaks down the barriers commercial building owners and tenants face in implementing works that reduce the energy, water or waste usage of an existing building, the installation of renewables and battery storage and heritage upgrade works. We believe that this simple mechanism will have a great success in South Australia and in the City of Adelaide. State Government has run an early adopter program through C- which has identified a number of opportunities, some of which are in this LGA. The proactive involvement of key players such as the Property Council and the openness of private owners in South Australia to this program has resulted in a significant amount of interest. Eureka would like to see $100 million of these transactions occur in South Australia, with this mechanism becoming business as usual for your property sector. Happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Ms Scott. Before you do, can I, um, Oliver, could you please check on Councillor Martin and see if he needs some water? Thank you, Councillor Martin. Members, do we have any questions, please? No questions? So I thank you very much for your deputation. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. Members, deputation, Robert, Mr Robert Sims has a deputation regarding change of date of Australia Day. Is Mr Sims with us? Welcome, Mr. Sims. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and thank you, councillors. I do promise I won't be making this a regular um, occurrence. We have seen a lot of former politicians weighing into political debate of late, um, but I do feel very strongly about this um, issue. And when I saw it reported in the media, I did want to come along and express my view um, because I think it's a view that is shared by many people within um, our city. Like many residents in the City of Adelaide, I believe it is a great shame that we do not celebrate Australia Day on a date on which all Australians, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, can enjoy. I have to say I was incensed by Councillor Antic's latest piece in the Advertiser, not for the first time, I might add, um, where he claimed that January 26 marks the beginning of human rights, such as free speech, the right to vote and the right to a fair trial. This is an absurd and offensive claim. It's particularly absurd when one considers that Aboriginal Australians weren't even given the right to vote in this country until 1962. It totally ignores the rich Aboriginal culture and history that preceded colonisation in this country. This attitude also fails to recognise the fact that January 26 is the anniversary of the arrival of the First Fleet and hence the beginning of the forced colonisation of Australia and all of, the human rights, uh, all of the human rights abuse that accompanied that. This human rights abuse included the stealing of children, the stealing of land and acts of genocide. There was nothing peaceful about it. 
Holding Australia Day on January 26, therefore, is deeply insensitive and, in my view, disrespectful. And understandably, this is a day of grief for many of our nation's first people. How can we hope for genuine reconciliation between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australians in our country if levels of government persist with this kind of insensitivity? We should acknowledge our nation's past and the ongoing impact of oppression on Aboriginal people today. And I think changing the date is a small way of moving us in that, uh, that direction. If Australia Day is really about celebrating our nation's democratic traditions, as has been claimed, then why not find an alternative day that is more historically relevant and respectful of our cultural history? The day our state became a federation could be an appropriate choice, or perhaps the day our national parliament first opened its doors. Of course, there are many other dates in the history of our nation that would be appropriate candidates for our national day. The City of Adelaide has an opportunity to show some leadership here. I understand there are these debates happening all around the country. Fremantle Council has recently backed changing the date, as has Hobart, and Adelaide can and should be setting the standard for other councils to follow. And I strongly encourage you to reject Councillor Antic's motion and to support changing the date of Australia Day. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sims. Members, do you have any questions, points of clarity, Mr. Sims? Councillor, <coughs> Councillor Antic. Thank you, Thank you Robert. Um, just a quick question. Are you familiar with any polling that's been done uh, in respect of people in the community uh, who are, uh, and what sort of percentage of people want the date changed? Are you, are you familiar with the McNair poll of earlier in the year, which suggests that 15 per cent of Australians like Australia Day where it is? Uh, Councillor, I don't believe decisions like this should be made on the basis of opinion polls. I would argue it is more appropriate to actually talk with Aboriginal people about their views on this issue, and certainly discussions I have had um, over the years uh, have informed my view that this is an inappropriate day um, and that we should be finding a date that's more culturally sensitive. And I actually think if you go out and talk to people in the community, that's a, a view that's quite widely shared. Now, notwithstanding, councillors, I'd like these questions to be points of clarity from Mr Sims's deputation. So do I have any further points of clarity that need to be asked? This matter will be debated without notice shortly. Mr Sims, thank you for joining us, City of Adelaide Council Chamber. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, councillors. Greatly appreciate it. <laughs> Members, our fourth deputation this evening is from Mr Philip de Bondi regarding short stay accommodation. Mr Debondi, welcome to the City of Adelaide Council Chamber and please join us for five minutes and the elected members may ask you questions. Okay, thanks. Oh, hi, my name is Philip Debondi. In July or late July I made a submission to Adelaide City Council regarding the problem I'm having uh, with short stay accommodation provider called r, &R. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to read that document. I'd also like to thank you for allowing me to speak today. Uh, my wife and baby, uh, we live at 8 Oliver Court, that's uh, just near Wakefield Street and Hutt Street. Uh, we love the CBD, we thought it would be a great place to raise our family. Uh, Adelaide City's strategic plan is to make sure that it was smart, green, livable and creative city. Uh, I think there's great reasons to live in the CBD, I love Adelaide. Uh, but right now it doesn't feel livable to me and it doesn't feel livable to the residents in my group. Uh, my peers sort of, I guess their perception of the city is that it's not a safe place and it's not a livable place to raise a family. Uh, to that at this point, I'm finding it hard to defend against. Uh, I read that the city is going to spend three million on making, or over three million, making the city more livable. Uh, if something isn't done in the way of sort of improving my scenario and the long term residents that are my neighbours, then I think you're going to fail on that. Uh, Everyone I, I pretty much know is excited and they want to know about what it's like to live in the CBD. For me, I have to tell them that it's not great. Uh, I tell them that I don't feel safe. I don't feel comfortable in my own home. I'm embarrassed where I live. I can't invite friends over on the weekends. Uh, it's difficult to sleep. I uh, end up impacting on my ability to go to work. I uh, had to clean up after guests weekend after weekend. Uh, and worst of all, up until this point, uh, no one's been willing to help. Um, not Adelaide City Council on first contact, not the state government, not my federal member, not SA Police, and not R&R &R management. 
It's not just me. Since my submission, I've been in contact with people who have had similar experience to mine. Uh, some of them are here tonight. Uh, some of them wrote letters of support, which I'd like to submit after this. Uh, one of those is a submission from a former employee of, of the operator that I'm just talking about. Uh, the stories are all similar. There's long-standing problems with short-stay guests and the company that manages them. This is true for different demographics and across multiple sites. As you're aware, I'm having problems with short-term stay accommodation provider and their guests. I've highlighted and articulated all of those issues in my submission and I don't have time to go over them here again. I would, however, like to reiterate that short-stay guests and local residents do not have a common interest. Short-stay accommodation providers currently take no responsibility for their guests, see long-term residents as an obstacle to doing business, Short-stay guests are not motivated to build connections in the community. They are not motivated to consider the interests of their neighbours and take a selfish view on their time here. There is no accountability or pathway for complaint resolution amongst residents. Uh, that leaves us feeling helpless and quite distressed. This problem is only going to get worth, worse. The forecast of growth for the CBD is to go to 50,000 from 23,000 at the moment. With the rise of Airbnb allowing more people to have unsupervised short stay accommodation, I only see this problem getting larger and larger. This has been true across other cities in Australia and around the world. Of those cities, many of them have already been able to put in place policies, procedures, bylaws and uh, legislation to try and counteract this. To date, to the best of my knowledge, Adelaide and the state government have been slow to respond. I wish I had more time to express my ideas on the solution. I've submitted some of them tonight along with those other submissions. Uh, I would just say that it is my opinion that short stay accommodation has no place in residential groups. And of all that I've read, I've not heard a single argument that says that short stay guests or short stay accommodation is good for long term residents. When you do look at some of the data, which I think is part of the motion, I sort of urge you to have a look and think about things on two fronts. One, there's nowhere for us to report, so where is this data going to come from? And two, some of my neighbours have been trying to complain about this problem for over 10 years, and at this point they've just given up. So you won't have anybody reporting, and if the prevalence, let's say for argument's sake, is lower than you expect, the impact on people like myself and my neighbours is huge. They deserve a response and they deserve a solution to this problem. Since my wife was racially abused, I've started a lot of the incidents. That's been from June. And so there's been an incident every single weekend. Look, I hope the motion passes. I'm happy to answer any of your questions. I'm happy to be an active participant in finding a solution. Uh, just like thank you for your time. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Devonley. We appreciate you, uh, your comments. Members, do you have any questions? Councillor Rabiat? Look, uh, thank you uh, for your uh, for your deputation. Do you mind um, explaining to us what a week in your life feels like? Because I'm trying to really understand. Uh, I appreciate. I've had a quick brief look at your report. Yep. It was sent this afternoon, and I'm happy to look at it later, even if potentially we can organise a visit for councillors. But yep. can you just maybe explain to us? what the impacts are, what do you think some of the solutions are? Yeah, so Sunday night is the best time for me because the weekend's over. And then as we progress towards sort of Friday, Friday morning I'll wake up and I'll start to get a bit anxious about what's going to happen that night. From about two o'clock when people start to check in, people will generally, if I was going to pick a demographic, I don't want to generalise too much, but it's large groups of males, either sort of 30-year-old sort of buck shows, party type houses, or uh, on last weekend it was uh, strippers or whatever was going on that I had to call the police on. Um, then what happens is also uh, colleges, so some of the schools around here, rather than the parents taking responsibility for their parties, will drop them off to our house or to the, the, the shared accommodation around us. Then it will start to crank up. Um, we'll try and get some resolutions from, from the police or from the management. Sometimes we get it, sometimes we don't. The police are very busy with other things on a Friday and Saturday night. It's very hard for them to respond. Um, and sometimes I've made approaches to, to the guests, but it's very hard for a guest to understand a, a resident's point of view. From their point of view, they've spent good money on all the portals that they have to book that. They just feel like they're booking a hotel and accommodation. And so when I'm coming in and saying, hey, look, you need to pipe down, they're like, well, it's a city. Why do you live here? Um, and when they're fueled with alcohol and drugs, uh, it's just 
It's not productive. There was one occasion where they threatened to rape my wife, where they broke into my house and urinated. It's relentless. So it, you might just say, oh, maybe it's, you justify it to yourself and say, oh, it's not that much noise, it's only early. But the reality is, if I had a long-term resident or even a tenant who was renting from those accommodations, I could build a relationship with that person. They might have a party every now and again, but in the harmony of living together, we'd find a way to make that work. Also, legislatively, I can't do anything because the way that this group has structured things is that they're not even the owner of the properties. They effectively are tenants who sublease, and that kind of allows them to not really be responsible because they don't own it. They don't care what happens to the property necessarily. That's the owner's point of view. Um, and then when it's a guest, they just say, well, it's a guest problem. And when the police come out, they can react, but they have to give a warning in the first instance under the EPA legislation. Under a nuisance, I have to be able to identify who these people are. There can sometimes be 30 to 40 people in one house. There are four of them in my group. So that's going to be anywhere between sort of, you know, 40 and 160 people in a group that's just not built for it. We only have 10, 10 townhouses. There's a small private route that, route that services them. Um, it's, I don't know what else to say, it's just ongoing. Um, in terms of solutions, to me, I don't think short, short stays that are unsupervised have any role to play in being approved. Um, I'm not sure if they need to be approved now, to be perfectly honest, um, but it seems very easy for one to pop up. I think there needs to be some legislation around them being supervised, that they would have to provide, for example, on-site management. Um, I don't think it's the responsibility of residents like myself to have to monitor their guest behaviour. I make no profit out of that, it's only hardship for me. Um, so I would like some things like that to be put in place. Um, and I'd like to see that the buildings having to be fit for purpose or modified to be fit for purpose. Um, we, as a residence, the walls were made in 99, the standards in terms of uh, what's appropriate there has left our house a little bit noisy, but when I have a resident that's in there, we can say, hey, you know, you're a bit loud last night, but when there's a group of 30 guys in a buck show with a stripper, they're not listening to me. Um, and then when they're coming in and out, as residents, we know that opening the gates or being loud in the courtyard is going to be heard through the whole group, but a guest that's just there once isn't going to know that. And, and so they're there, they'll be out on the balconies till 5 a.m., 6 a.m., and any attempt to try and get it sort of resolved, I just feel helpless. There's nothing I can do about this. I'm sure that this won't be an issue that's totally part of the Adelaide City Council, but at this point, you're the only ones who've listened to me. Um, and I'm just a physio. The chance of me being able to get the state government to put in the legislation that's required is pretty slim, whereas the people here are well respected, you're the leaders of the community. If it comes from you, I think I've got a much better chance of getting that put through. Thank you, Mr. Devondi. Thank you, Councillor Abia. Uh, Councillor Milani and then Councillor Wilkinson. Questions, please. Thank you. I just had um, three quick questions. One is, um, what is the police saying? Because there were, there were examples you just cited of yep. what I call illegal activity, or you know, yep. what are the police? Same. Well, they can respond. Um, I had uh, Inspector Frank, what's his name, David, I can't remember his name, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, it was part of the ministerial because I've also put this to the Premier as well. Um, and he said, look, we can respond to these things. If there's threats, we, we can take action. Um, but it's not going to help you from every week with the drunkenness and the carry-on that goes on. Also, I'm coming out, I don't have my glasses on, I can't identify who's hurling the abuse, I don't have enough time to see who's urinated on my floor, I can't see who's banging on my wall, or, you know, I, it's going to be really hard to prosecute that. And because they have a level of anonymity, um, I feel that that escalates them, they feel like they, they can get away with it. When the police have come out on one occasion, uh, the tenants locked themselves in, in the house, and because the police had no right to enter the house at that point, we called the manager um, and they didn't respond. And so the police, it was a rainy night, we're gonna try and climb over the balcony, but we have a three-story townhouse. So I said, look, it's not, not worth that. Um, they're, they're good, but in their capacity, they're only reactive. Okay. And my second quick question was, I've gathered it's a group of townhouses. Um, 
the business that you're referring to, that is actually the commercial business operating in that townhouse. It's not an, it's not like you running out of It's not me setting up, isn't it? It's a commercial business? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mulaney. Councillor Wilkinson. Um, in uh, planning law, there's a dis differentiation between short-term accommodation and residential, and in some residential areas, short-term accommodation is, is a non-compliant use where the council can take planning application. Um, is the situation in the city zone where you are that short-term accommodation is a permitted use? Is I'm not really sure. It's, no, it's, right. I haven't. If it if it isn't great. But I'm pretty sure these apartments were set up by Quest originally. Um, they seem to set up a lot of apartments. So from what I gather, they would have probably looked into that and set this structure up to make it difficult to move them on. But I honestly just don't know. It's not, it's not my area. I'd love it not to be the case. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that is the planning mechanism that is available to look at. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Members, I don't see any further hands. Mr Devondi, thank you very much indeed for your deputation of the City of Adelaide Council Chamber this evening. Yes, please. If we could assist, please, Ed, with the distribution of Mr Devondi's handouts. Members, our fifth and final deputation this evening in the Council Chambers from Ms Kelly Henderson. Uh, Ms Henderson, welcome to the City of Adelaide Council Chamber. I have a number of matters that you would like to discuss here. If you could please advise the members as to which matter or matters you'd like to debate. We will afford you five minutes and the members may elect to ask you questions. Welcome. Okay. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, normally the deputations that have been accepted and declined would have been uh, um, notified to the members, but this is a, a unique situation. Um, you've actually granted me permission to speak on any one or any number of the deputation applications that I made, which was 6.2, uh, which I can't speak about, because. Uh, but I'll note that, this is no time, I'll note that the proposal is to destroy remnant native vegetation south of the netball courts, which this council is duty bound under its CLMPs and, and legally bound under the Local Government Act to protect. Um, and that the proposal to give consent to the administration to carry on in advance of the public consultation is unconscionable, disgraceful and disgusting. And such a submission should never be made to you by your administration and you should not can countenance it. I can't talk about the revocation of community land, but you know the community opposes it for good reason, as do I. I can't talk about the pontoon because I don't have time, uh, but that too, um, that's the, one of the great instances where the administration has put a very good report to you and their motion at the last, proposal at the last meeting should have been adopted post haste forthwith. Uh, you can't countenance or con uh, condone a, a pontoon or a structure being uh, temporarily established and then becoming a site for commercial business in the parklands or in the riverbed. Um, and the cooperation with councils, your response to UNLI Council indicates that that is, um, you know, not an option because that takes too much time. So, Lord Mayor, with respect, the only item that I can address in the time you've given me is 9.3. Um, Lord Mayor, this council has a great many uh, firsts, but there are several important ones that are not recognised, and I'd like to commence my deputation by thanking the, the Lady Mayoress and Councillor Wilkinson and yourself for bringing to public notice on a permanent basis the trick station on the corner of North Terrace and West Terrace which is the commencement point not only for the survey of the City of Adelaide, but also the commencement point, the practical work of the trigonometrical survey of the District of Adelaide, the world's first coordinated cadaster. It is due entirely to the support of the Lady Marys that the 180th commemorative event went ahead as it did. 
It is entirely due to uh, the Lady Mayor's, Lord Mayor, Councillor Wilkinson, to your attendance and support on that day that we now have a permanent bronze monument that's going to be installed with council funding into the pavement in accordance with the project of the National Trust and the International Federation of Surveyors, a seven year project, which thanks to your efforts on that day, will now go ahead. Um, I would like to talk about another important first, which is Australia's and the basis for a better Australia Day, which is Australasia's first Gallipoli and first Anzac Memorial, um, which was consecrated, dedicated and unveiled as a national event by the Australia's uh, Governor General on the 7th of September 1915 at the Gallipoli Grove on Cohen Avenue. Uh, Mr Sims has, has pointed out that Councillor Antic's comments about the importance and the significance and the, and the good works of the settlement of the occupation in 1788 are absurd and offensive. I agree, they are factually incorrect. But so too is Councillor, um, former Councillor Sims' submission to this chamber. It is ludicrous, absurd and offensive to state that Indigenous Australians were not allowed to vote in this country until 1962. That is totally false. Of course, Australia Day is actually an anniversary of the first landing day for New South Wales, the convict jail that Bentham castigated as unconstitutional, an unconstitutional jail. South Australia's history has nothing whatsoever to do with that because our, our state was excised from the rest of Australia in February 1836. Australia Day as it stands now is the foundation day for the New South Wales convict jail. It is the anniversary day of that event and on the 30th anniversary in 1818, Governor Macquarie, the Governor of New South Wales, made that a public holiday by firing 30 guns to mark every year of the convict jail's occupation of New South Wales. Our state's history is much more the evidence of free democracy and freedom of religion and family values to build a colony that women would come to because the men would follow them, not a co colony for convicts. Um, the, I um, encourage you to conclude well, your arguments, Mr. Well, I hope, the, I hope the timing has started from the commencement of my deputation and not the clarification of the Ministry of Issues. I'll afford you an extra 30 seconds. <laughs> Longer than that, I hope. Um, the Australian Model Day League federalised in 1913. The inaugural president, Lord Mayor, uh, was Sir William J. Southern, the state's uh, Model Day League branch president. So South Australia was the first federal headquarters. And in that federal role, it instituted not only in 1914, Australia's first war memorial, the Oak, but also the Gallipoli Memorial Water Grove and Anzac Day. Uh, cenotaph. Um, it was a monument to the landing day and has recently been castigated as being needing greater prominence but that throws us back to 1914 and we are firmly in Groundhog Day because in 1940 the Grey Ward councillor, Councillor Myers, proposed that that be moved to the tram corner oh, on yeah, South Terrace longer than 30 seconds. to a new garden to a new garden, Lord Mayor. Ms Henderson, I do need you to conclude your arguments. I've afforded uh, five minutes to okay, well, all speakers this evening. Uh, I'd like to have these circulated then, please, while I finish, because I believe you won't have received them. That's entirely acceptable. Right, so Robert Musil stated that there's nothing so invisible as a monument. Oh, that's not, that's not the whole thing, there it is. It's probably true. Thank you, Ms Henderson. To our war memorials on most days of the year. But the practice of Anzac Day gathered popularity as a day of solemn remembrance. The first Anzac Memorial in Australia... Ms. Henderson, I do need you to conclude your arguments, please. ...was on the 7th of November... Uh, sorry, 7th of September in the Gallipoli Wattle Grove. And what I'd like to suggest to Council is the better day for Australian uh, uh, celebration is the Wattle Day League's 
uh, consecration day of Ms. Edison, the Ms. thank you. The members the now have the handout the which uh, has been distributed, so we appreciate your time. Members, do you have any questions of Ms. Henderson's deputation? I'll have to add, Lord Mayor, that the agreement between the Council and the Water Day League, the documents which you've received, indicates that the Council has to maintain the Grove and the Cenotaph in accordance with Tarot's plan, which you've also received. Thank you and very I much for your deputation, Ms Henson. We greatly minutes. appreciate it. The members will read your handout with great interest. and We appreciate your time and your passion. Thank, Thank you. you. Members, that now concludes five deputations. Uh, thank you everyone for making a deputation to the City of Adelaide Council Chamber. Always appreciate it. I will now, members, further to my prior discussion regarding, regarding motion on notice item 9.3, which has been withdrawn by Councillor Antic. I will now invite Councillor Antic to put forward a motion without notice, which is, I understand, a variation on the theme. Councillor and members, I understand that this will now be put on your screens for you to consider. Councillor, we're in your hands. Um, thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I think that is correct. Just for, by way of uh, clarification, that the alternative motion, I might read it out for the benefit of the chamber, is a slight variation on the original. Uh, and <coughs> if you read that out, then we'll seek a secondary. Well, it is effectively the same point one, except with a couple of um, clarifications as to the naming of the body, body of the Australian Local Government Association National General Assembly. Councillor, can I encourage you to read it verbatim, yeah. please? Thank Just you, Lord Mayor. Of the yeah, gallery and your fellow members. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> that Council 1 notes uh, in June 2017, the Australian Local Government Association National General Assembly endorsed a resolution to encourage Australian councils to consider efforts they could take to lobby the federal government to change the date of recognition of Australia Day and two, instructs the Lord Mayor to write to the Australian Local Government Association to express concern regarding the above resolution and express the view that the date of Australia Day should remain a matter for the federal government to determine. You have a second to Councillor Moran. The floor is yours for I'll three just, minutes, Councillor. Thank you. I'll just clarify that. The original motion uh, looked to uh, write in, in relation to supporting the 26th of January is the, the date for Australia Day. Well, there are so to interrupt. Uh, which item on service Australia does to call a conflict or anything? Yes, yes. Thank you, Councillor Abiyad. Thank you for bringing that to the attention of your fellow members. Thank you. Just wanted to, uh, <laughs> on record, declare a, um, what we call it a perceived conflict, not one of the material. I'm actually not sure what the motion is. If the motion has been dropped, Lord Mayor, I'd love to hear what the motion is first before sorry, I call a perceived conflict. Oh, sorry. Councillor, please read it, uh, and then you can make your own value judgment as to whether you have a perceived actual material. Yeah, you should. Um, so just by way of clarification... Councillor, I'll just ask you to wait for a moment, if you could, please, yeah. as Councillor Abiyad reads your motion, and then we have to make a decision, then we can proceed with the debate. <clears throat> Look, I'll still call as a perceived conflict with man. I'd like to exit the room um, as being the chair of the Australian Council. <laughs> thank you for bringing that to the attention of your fellow members, Councillor Abiyad. Thank you. Councillor Antic, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, all right, so the original motion uh, talked in specific terms, very similar motion, similar themes, uh, except in the case of the first motion, uh, it created a specific intention to write to the Prime Minister to support the date of the 26th of January. Uh, now, I want to be very clear about this. Uh, there is no watering down of that aspect of, uh, of the motion from a personal point of view. My view is that that is the date and it should be and it should remain so. But we've had some administrative comment uh, and that has uh, been very helpful. And the administrative comment uh, on in relation to the motion suggests that the, uh, the Australian Local Government Association Board uh, did not ratify that motion the following day which is very pleasing, um, except to say uh, that uh, they did so um, according to this information on the basis that they would leave that matter to respective councils and communities. Uh, so I think that's halfway there, Lord Mayor. Um, but of course, uh, the issue is that this is a national day. Um, this is not, as I've said several times, a matter which should be weighed into by local government. So the amended motion, if you will, or the variation seeks simply to maintain the status quo simply by way of leaving the decision in the hands of the Australian Federal Government, which is the most appropriate cause, course, I should say. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, based on that, on that premise, uh, I, uh, I, I've withdrawn the other two points. Um, however, I will say that if that matter ever was to come up, 
I would speak very strongly uh, in opposition to a change of the date from the 26th of January. Uh, but uh, Thank you, members. So you have point one and point two before you as a motion from Councillor Antic. You're seconded by Councillor Moran. Councillor Moran, do you wish to speak to it? So, members, I go to the floor. Councillor Hendon. I move this motion lay on the table. You would need a seconder for that. That would be Councillor Martin. Now, members, customarily with a, can I just take procedural advice, please? Okay, members, this matter has been put forward by Councillor Hender to be laid on the table. It's been seconded by Councillor Martin. Effectively, that means, members, that I put that straight for the vote. Everyone's aware of this procedurally? So, members, I'm now going to call that vote. Those in favour of laying this matter on the table? Those against? So, carried. The matter is now laid on the table. Thank you, members. Gallery, please, Lord Mayor. Yes, please. Judy, can you explain that procedurally to the gallery? Thank you, Lord Mayor. The outcome of the motion that was just adopted by the Council is that there will be no further discussion on the motion without notice proposed by Councillor Antic at this point in time. The matter has been laid on the table to be discussed at some other point in time. So there'll be no further conversation this evening on that matter. Lord Mayor, can I just withdraw my, that was my, not my understanding of the motion, so I, I vote in opposition to that. Um, noted, thank you. Councillor Corbell, you have a question? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Yes, um, just a point of clarification as well. At what point could this matter be, um, could, could it re-emerge as something for Council to consider? That's a legitimate question, Judy. The matter can be reconsidered in a meeting of Council and there are two ways to do that. By presenting a report via the CEO requesting that the matter be lifted, that report will contain the information as to at what point this meeting stopped consideration of the topic. The other means to bring this matter off the table is that a motion without notice be moved and seconded and adopted by the meeting to lift the matter and recommence conversation on the topic. Members, no further debate. Council Moran, you have a question? Just a query on that advice. Um, has the rules for lift, uh, lifting something off the table changed, Mr. Beckles? Because in the last time when we did it, anybody at any point could lift it off the table and it didn't need a motion without notice, a motion without notice to lift it. But if I can clarify for you, a motion without notice is the opportunity that any member has in a meeting of council to identify a topic of discussion. So you can move so, it at so, any oh, point. So time. this would become the motion without notice. It doesn't need a separate thing to lift it. It so does I, need I just, a motion. I just about to lifting lift. this off the table and get a second. Correct. You would have to move a motion that the matter be lifted. You would need a second, and the meeting would have to adopt that. Yes. So it's the Thanks. same procedure. Yes, I've got, I've got, yeah, got it. Members, thank you very much. If we could please invite Councillor Abiyad back into the chamber and I'll recommence the meeting. You need to consult Aboriginal people on this issue if you want to have a valid reason to do vote yes or no against it. So I'd hope that next time you do that. But to my knowledge, nobody has been consulted seeing how it affects Aboriginal people. Thank you. Okay, now members, as we bring Councillor Abia back into the chamber and Councillor Hendo, I'm sure, will be joining us shortly, uh, again, in the interests of uh, members of the gallery, I'm going to, now having dealt with that matter without notice, I'm going to now deal with item 9.4, Councillor Corbell, which is your motion which is regarding the accommodation, sharing, economy and impacts on residents of the City of Adelaide, just in the interest of time and young children in our chamber. So I'll just wait, Council. I've got a quorum, so you can proceed. Okay, thank Floor you. Floor is yours. Um, I'm seeking a seconder for my motion entitled Accommodation, Sharing, Economy and Impacts on Residents. Seconded by Councillor Wilkinson. Thank Floor you. is yours for thank three you minutes, Councillor Cook. Um, just briefly, I'd like to share my rationale as to why I've moved this motion. Um, it was brought to my attention by Mr De Bondi's um, document outlining um, the adverse situation he's been living in as a result of R&R's short-term accommodation, um, which are 
part of his apartment complex that he lives in. And um, more broadly, my motion seeks to address the situation of businesses that are um, their businesses around short-term accommodation in addition to residents of the city who will be affected by Airbnb type accommodation, which is not necessarily business. It could just be somebody letting out space in their home, um, an apartment or an entire um, premises. And for the administration to undertake some work around identifying the impact that this is having on our community. And in addition to that, noting that there are some cities around the world, such as San Francisco, Berlin, Barcelona, London, Amsterdam, and New York, that have implemented measures to regulate short-term accommodation, such as Airbnb, um, that the City of Adelaide explore this as an option. Um, while researching for in preparation for my motion, I found an article um, by the ABC um, from the 19th of June, which was around Airbnb, Airbnb tourist surge. Councils may consider taxes and register to support long-term residents looking to rent in Airbnb. Airbnb's um, Brent Thomas actually suggested that they are favourable towards working with um, local jurisdictions such as local government in identifying opportunities <laughs> to regulate. So this is something which I hope my motion will achieve for our administration to look at ways that the City of Adelaide could regulate um, short-term accommodation and um, of the sharing economy such as Airbnb, um, in addition to businesses such, an, uh, such as R&R, &R, and also um, enforcement of that, what we might do should, um, should, should businesses and Airbnb um, business owners not be abiding by our regulations that we might impose, uh, which could be um, fines and permits. It could be as simple as a, a system of registering the apartments and the premises in the city which are um, lettered out as part of the sharing economy because we don't have that at the moment. And that would facilitate law enforcement, for example, um, if they could have access to this list as well. Potentially it could facilitate situations such as what Mr. Devondi has experienced. This is about us leading the way. We are the capital city for South Australia. And to my knowledge and from the article that I mentioned earlier, no other city in Australia right now has undertaken this body of work aside from Hobart, which is in the process of exploring this at the moment. So I um, put the motion for you for consideration and open it up for debate. Thank you, Councillor Corbell. Councillor Wilkinson, you seconded. Do you wish to speak to the matter? Yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I commend uh, Councillor Corbell uh, for this um, motion. And um, in the question time, I raise the issue about the distinction between short term accommodation and normal uh, residential. Thing. There's a distinction in, in uh, planning, planning law. Um, council, with the cooperation of the state government, has the potential to, to look at zoning where short-term accommodation is allowed and to not allow in, in residential areas. If we are truly earnest in our ambition to grow the city's population and make more people want to choose to live in the city, clearly having unfettered short-term accommodation, which can be highly profitable for you know, certain people or operators to buy residential property but then rent it out on this sort of commercial basis is unfair to affected residences and is actually counter it, it actually counters our endeavours to improve the appeal of city living if their whole experience is tainted in a manner that we heard um, in the deputation. And uh, just as I want to see the character and appeal of the city maintained as part of the appeal of the city, it's also this mixture of land use and how we manage this thing is critical. You can't just say yes to everything and all. And then, and then, and then get good stats for high, high numbers because it will backfire <coughs> on the city if we don't actually regulate these things properly. And that means our administration, but this thing then needs to enforce it and take people to task when they don't comply with the, uh, with the, uh, you know, the regulations that hopefully will get put in place to try and make this a proper uh, livable city, and not not just one where certain people are basically cashing in on the. Uh, on the new uh, sort of uh, laissez-faire short-term accommodation thing 
enabled by Airbnb. I think it needs to be uh, it needs to be managed very carefully, and I think uh, the deputation this evening just spelled out very plainly why why we need to do this. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. I've got Councillor Maloney, followed by Councillor Perahan, followed by Councillor Martin, followed by Councillor Hinder, followed by Councillor Abia. Councillor Maloney, floor is yours. Popular topic. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, um, I'll support the um, the motion. One of my I actually have a question um, because I, I'm not a big fan of overly undertaking cumbersome reports for the sake of identifying information that we do already have a bit of a handle on. Picking up on Councillor Wilkinson's point, my, my first question is, um, we do have a mechanism under current regulation where there are businesses operating in, in residential zones where they, where they can't be operating. Can, can I just get some, we, we already know how to handle some of this. Um, so I'm keen to know what, what mechanisms we already have in play. Um, at the same time, I also want to encourage the visitor economy, and that's an important element to our city. So we also want to acknowledge, acknowledge that there are a lot of good operators that do the right thing, and, and that we should, um, and we should support that. Um, so I'll support the report. But can I just get some information on? We know now what what, what rules we can and what regulations are in play. Um, what are we doing about that? Thank you, Councillor. See you. Yes, yeah, through you, Lord Mayor. We received um, the information pack. Um, Councillor Clarehan provided a copy to me recently. Um, following receipt of that, I had a conversation um, with our Associate Director of Planning, Shanti Gitter. I don't think she's here tonight, but um, had a conversation about planning controls and what we can do to control such developments. Fair to say that um, um, I understand these sorts of operations are permitted but they do require an approval. Um, and therefore, I think it, it demonstrates the need for us to review our development plan and the control mechanisms. And I think that the report that's being called for will enable us to have a, a thorough review of that situation. Thank you. Yes, I, I know examples of where um, uh, businesses that are operating from residential premises, I have one next door to my house, and council got rid of it under the current planning regulation because it didn't have approval. It's quite, there are instances where it's sometimes as simple as that. So I welcome the report, um, but I do know that there is stuff, that's November 2017, I do know there is um, the ability for us to take action as of today to help out um, these situations. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Clearhand, followed by Councillor Martin. Thank you, Lord Mayor. and. Um, and thank you, Mr. De Bondi, for coming along tonight and also presenting um, what to us is a dire situation, whereby it seems that no one agency has been able to respond to what is has become an absolutely impossible situation for those some of those people who have chosen to invest in in our city, to live in our city. It seems to me that we have um, a number of unscrupulous operators who are cashing in on the abs at the expense of absolute misery of our, of our residents. And this really ought not to go on. Um, I am absolutely amazed that this has been going on for as long as it has and creating such an adverse situation for those people who have chosen to buy, who have chosen to rent long term in our city. It is totally unacceptable. And if it means that we need to request changes to legislation, well then, so be it. There are some obviously um, uh, other mechanisms that can be undertaken. I mean. Do we, for example, are we up to speed with ensuring that these full-term, short-term uh, rentals are being charged at commercial rate and not a residential rate? I mean, these are some of the things that we may already have jurisdiction over and we need to come in and, and uh, make sure that uh, these people are um, are uh, being responsible in more ways than one. I mean, uh, also, is there's issues around rubbish and cleanup. Short-term renters 
especially if they're in party mode, uh, be it stag party or whatever, will leave a lot of rubbish behind. And I'm sure they're not bothering to take it with them. So, you know, what sort of impact is that having on our collection as well? I mean, there are lots of small issues now that I think our administration are able to move on, given the detailed um, requests by this motion. I'm also believing that it's probably appropriate for our council to put up a motion to the local government association annual general meeting because I doubt that this issue is just an issue for the city of Adelaide. I suspect that any place that might have uh, increasing share, of, um, share of accommodation, and in particular those areas that are seen as holiday destinations, like Glenelg, like Victor Harbour, for example, they would be de have been dealing with these issues for some time. So given the growth of the share economy, um, and the increase in the number of short-term rentals, we need to move on this and as quickly as possible. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Martin, followed by Councillor Hendon. Thank you, Lord Mayor. If I begin coughing, I'll cease. Um, look, I, I just want uh, to make clear that this is a problem that is citywide. Last year, Councillor Clearahan and I visited a residential address in North Adelaide where the neighbours were complaining about a Airbnb establishment which had sprung up in the neighbourhood. Now, I'm not singling out Airbnb, it's a style of accommodation that I'm talking about. Uh, the building, which was separate to the main house, had been constructed for another purpose, but it was let as an Airbnb uh, residence. The neighbours complained it had become a party house. Uh, that there were constant uh, problems with noise, uh, even extending to people uh, trespassing on their properties and urinating in the yards. In fact, one woman was terrified by uh, the fear that something worse would happen to her. Now, their investigation and my inquiries of the administration of that time was that there wasn't much that council could do about it. And indeed, nothing has done about, uh, been done about this case. Now, I, uh, I thank uh, um, Councillor Corbell for referring to those international locations where there have been regulations to control short-term accommodation, New York among them, not least because it's also, uh, the city says, having an impact on uh, accommodation for residents. But in New South Wales, the state government is wrestling with this at the moment as a consequence of a report from the Upper House of the Parliament. And it is specifically looking at how to handle rogue operators in the business of short-term accommodation where there is inadequate supervision of tenants and where there are no enforcement tools. And a big part of its inquiries is to try and find out what tools local government needs to deal with this. And I'd ask the administration in the process of investigating this to examine what tools it is that we need to be able to act on behalf of our ratepayers and whether, of course, that requires any amendment to state legislation. This is a serious problem, and I thank our uh, speaker tonight, Mr. De Bondi, and also Councillor Corbell for raising this. Uh, I look forward to receiving a detailed report from the administration. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Hender, followed by Councillor Abia. Just quickly, I also support the seeking of a report, but I also have the concerns that <coughs> Councillor Malani indicated that we do need to be um, supportive of a wide variety of accommodation in the in the city, and that includes um, uh, the visit, you know, to anything that we can do to encourage the visitor economy. Um, I do think we also need to, and I just wanted to make this point. I think we need to. I'm very keen that we get a report and see what levers there are that we can pull and what levers that the state government can pull. But I do think we need to acknowledge that these are these are rogue operators. For the most part, there, there are a number of um, people who do operate short-stay accommodation and Airbnb accommodation and take full responsibility for the, for the things that they do on their premises. Uh, and they do that with respect, uh, for paying full respect to their neighbours. Um, so I, don't, I think we need to be really careful that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater in this case. Airbnb in particular, I do think we need to draw a big distinction between that and the circumstances that Mr. De Bondi uh, has described in the Airbnb operators generally, not always, but generally are letting out part of their own home and therefore are supervising it. 
uh, they also often own the property and so they're known to the neighbours and so they give the, the neighbours a single point of contact if, if there are difficulties. And of course it's got an internal rating system so that um, you can always, uh, an Airbnb operator can make sure they don't let to um, to crazy party people, or at least people who've been crazy party people elsewhere, so that they can make sure that their premises are well well, well kept. Um, so I think all those things need to be taken into account in the preparation of the report, that we just make that clear distinction. This is about, let's be honest, rogue operators, unscrupulous people who, who are who are treating the, the people and, um, who, and residents who live around the places where they operate their businesses with complete disregard, and I support any effort we can make to to improve the circumstances of those residents. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Abia. Um, thank you, Mayor. Without uh, having to add too much, I am happy to support this current report to come back to Council, but I have massive concerns around over-regulation of specific industries in the city. Um, where does it stop and how far does it go? It's really important. Uh, there's specific owners of properties in the city of Adelaide that can already let a room out. It doesn't have to be under an Airbnb. Yes, it is supervised. These people could be good, they could be bad. Um, I think from the deputation we've heard today and some of the other concerns noted, it's really important uh, to be able to take into account um, the current situation and deal with it as harshly and as hard as we can. I think we have an issue here with an operator that is not doing the right thing by the neighbourhood and we should uh, try as much as we can through using our existing policies, working through the state government to try to manage the current situation. I don't want to see a situation in which we will trigger a huge amount of over-regulation on the back of a minority uh, incident uh, that has happened to a few people in the city that could potentially impact everyone. Uh, I think we need to be able to understand that there's a way that the future uh, people are using uh, home share accommodation apps like Airbnb, like some of the other applications around, uh, and the people that do cross the globe, the globe sometimes and they share homes, uh, and uh, that's something that occurs and has been occurring for a very long time. I think in this situation, I feel uh, very sorry, and I feel, um, you know, I definitely feel with, with, uh, with the person that did give the deputation earlier, that situation specifically needs to be dealt with and dealt with very, very harshly. If, if all those accusations and everything that's been put through is true, that needs to be dealt with. But I don't want to see that trigger an over-regulation of everything we're doing in the city of Adelaide. Uh, I don't think we need to have a collective approach to punishing everyone because there's a few that do the right thing. Uh, and I just want to sort of echo that to administration. It's really important that um, you try to take this on notice as part of your report. Um, I don't want us to regulate a whole industry. Um, on the words of Councillor Clearahan before, if we want to go down that path um, of charging commercial rates to people that rent their homes or provide short-term stays, where does it end? Uh, I mean, there are some serious concerns. I have some serious concerns with over-regulating that part of the industry. Uh, so it's important that we stay out of it, but we deal with the vigilantes and we deal with people that are doing the wrong thing um, harshly and promptly. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Abia. Members, do I have any further debate? I don't see any hands, so I'm going to put you back to the mover, Councillor Corbell, to sum up. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I just wanted to point out that my motion isn't actually focused um, in a negative way. Um, on the contrary, I'm quite favourable of um, the accommodation sharing economy. Um, I have myself have used stays um, and I've used Airbnb, I've travelled widely and um, I acknowledge that it's increasingly becoming an option for travellers and tourists globally. Um, so really my motion is seeking to achieve us having a look at this. It, Airbnb has been a disruptive force in the hotel industry globally and we as a local government should be having a look at it. We should be having a look at what is available to us to regulate what is happening in our city. Um, I think it, we wouldn't be um, doing the right thing if we hadn't had this discussion and have asked our administration to do this work and bring it back into the chamber. I've asked that they provide us with um, some recommendations for regulations, which could include registration, permits, zoning, um, the safety and health regulation considerations, in addition to enforcement options, um, potentially fines. I don't think this is about over-regulation. I think it's just about us having a discussion and asking our administration to do due diligence. 
Thank you, Councillor Corbell. Yeah, um, also, Ryan. ask for the state government for, yes. for us to be provided with the options for state government, recognising that in New South Wales, the state government has taken on board regulating this. Um, so I put it to you, hopefully everyone supports it, and I'm looking forward to receiving the report back in November. Councillors, I put this motion before you. Those in favour? Those against? We carry. Members, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Corbell. That concludes item 9.4. Members, I'm now going to take you back to item 6 on your agenda, most specifically 6.1, participation in building upgrade finance. Do I have a mover? Councillor Maloney, seconded by Councillor Moran. You're moving as printed, Councillor Maloney? I am, Lord Mayor. Um, I, um, I think out of the, there's a lot of um, meaty stuff on the agenda for this council tonight. This happens to be one of my particular favourite items. I think this is a fantastic initiative. Obviously, have someone in in the um, audience that uh, shares that passion. I think this um, this scheme or incentive um, is. Uh, a great opportunity for us to practically um, address the issue of commercial vacancy in our city. I think it's great that it not only incorporates environmental upgrade for building, but um, Councillor Wilkinson should also be doing cartwheels around the absolute um, opportunity it opens for heritage um, upgrade as well in our city. I, um, I do congratulate everyone from Council and State and you know, Bruce Carter and the working advisory group that was set up to look at this and the change of legislation that was required. And I do um, uh, have a rhetorical question about how we're really going to get out and promote this and I hope that we, we do actually proactively go out. I noticed in the report that there are a number of property owners that have already flagged an interest, so we're off to a good start. Um, and I think it would be great that Adelaide leads the way in um, being a, a, a partner to this program. Um, so I en encourage everyone to endorse it. Thank you. Vote for it. Thank you, Councillor Moraney. Councillor Moran, you seconded. Do you wish to speak to it? Members, do I have any debate from the floor? Councillor Moraney, back to you. Summed up well, Ben. Members, I put this before you for the vote. Those in favour? Those against? We carry item 6.1, which takes us directly onto item 6.2, project delivery approach for Park 22 and Park 25 to support and authorise. Moved by Councillor Milani, seconded by Councillor Abiyad. Councillor Milani, you wish to speak to the matter? Reserving your right. Councillor Abiyad? Reserve Members, any debate? Councillor Martin. Uh, Lord Mayor, just to explain that I can't support this again, it uh, includes the roadway. Uh, that is the uh, the golden path for members of SACA, which the ratepayers of Adelaide are funding. I note, by the way, the cost has gone up again. In the last bit of paperwork we received, it said the cost was under a half a million dollars and it's back up to $850,000 or $830,000 tonight. But uh, be that as it may, um, I want to emphasise that I do support the upgrade to the netball courts at Park 22. It's long overdue. But I, I do regret, Lord Mayor, that this has not been to Council previously. In fact, tonight we're being asked to approve this, and indeed its history is that you attended a media conference last month at which uh, John Rowe announced this. And then uh, uh, from the document here I see from 10.1 to 10.6, um, we have already uh, signed the grant funding agreement the project funds have already been transferred to the City of Adelaide. The project control group has been formed consistent with the requirements of the funding agreement, which we have not seen, and consultation is ongoing. Um, I, I'm not aware of any of this having come to Council. and uh, It may happen. I stand corrected if it has, and I don't believe it's been to Adler either, but I'll stand corrected if it has. I, I, uh, I think this is a matter that ought to have at least uh, come to Council for some consideration before the agreement was signed. Thank you, Councillor Martin. I'm going to refer you to the CEO. I'd like to make a comment, please. Then I'll go back to the floor. Three, to the three Lord Mayor, works under four million dollars. I understand I have the delegation to be able to undertake those works. Um, I'm happy to follow up on the referral to APLA and uh, I'll get some advice on that as soon as I can. Thank you, CEO. Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, with Park 25, that's the SACA proposal. Um, 
Uh, this is about council um, endorsing the, uh, uh, the the tender process. Uh, have the uh, recommendations of APLA regarding the lighting and the colour of the aggregate been uh, taken on board with this at this stage? See you. Beth, thank you. Uh, through you, Mayor, thank you. Um, consistent with the comments we made in the last council meeting and some discussions we've had, those elements will certainly be in the detailed design for the concepts, yes. So that will happen. Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Members, do I have any further debate? I don't. Councillor Maloney, back to you to sum up. Summed up. Members, to the floor to vote. Those in favour? Those against? We carry. Thank you, members. Members, the item 6.3, which is page 20 on your papers, is, which is the relocation of community land, uh, Central Market Arcade. Uh, do I have a mover? I have Councillor Maloney with hand up first, followed by Councillor Aviard. Councillor Maloney, do you wish to speak to this matter? Just to say, Lord Mayor, that um, this is the, the first step in um, what is a, a longer process ahead, but um, a good first step nonetheless. So um, I encourage everyone to support it. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah. Councillor Abia? Oh, Members? Councillor Martin? Just a question, Lord Mayor. The, uh, the administration provides us with paperwork here saying that the cost of this proposal in the 17-18 financial year is $500,000. And the administration has also prepared a uh, flyer that has gone out with rate notices to all of our rate payers, saying that the allocation for the 2017-18 financial year for the Central Market Arcade is $3.2 million. Is it half a million or 3.2 million? CEO. Steve Matheson, thanks. Tom McCready. Through you, Lord Mayor, I can talk to the 500,000 councillor. I'm not aware of the 3.2, 3.1. We'll come back in regards to that. That may be a capital component in regards to central market, but we'll check on that. The 500,000 is associated with the project itself, which is the central market arcade, and actually they relate to uh, the legal provisions, the marketing associated, the EY process, and actually when it comes to the leasing process in regards to managing the tenancy uh, thereafter. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Wilkinson. Um, yes, in supporting this, um, the outcome that I'm hoping that we will see is one of the ugliest buildings in Adelaide, then the coals on Grove Street being demolished and replaced with a reinstatement of the demolished Federation Hall extension of the market through this exercise. And I know I had to push very hard to, you know, within council to get that as part of the uh, terms of what this whole lease is, but that is the outcome. Which I'm looking forward to seeing the reason why I support this whole initiative in the first instance, um, and where we can actually, uh, through our control of the uh, the land, through our part ownership or through our ownership, we, we can um, uh, get a better outcome on the site than you would under ordinary zoning if it was just left in free market, for the current anything goes planning regime. So. Um, it's a, it's a great opportunity to create, achieve some great outcomes for the city in terms of the reform from Grove Street to Gucci Street and also you know, an expansion of our central market as, a, as our uh, fresh free produce market. Um, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Members, do I have any further debate? Before I hand you back to the mover, Councillor Maloney, I might make a brief comment if I can, members, please. The guiding principles which you crafted in late 2016, I must say, are serving this project very well. And Councillor Wilkins is just referring to one of them. Uh, there are a number of them. And uh, in terms of our communications with traders, stakeholders, uh, and in the future, I'd imagine quite a number of parties associated with this project in the future, those, those guiding principles will remain extremely important. So well done, members. Uh, Councillor Abia, would you like to make a comment? You've spoken. No, I haven't thought it was ever asked. You reserved your right. Yes, you did. Yeah, yeah so I've got to be brief. Um, this is a real exciting opportunity for Council with a project that I think this Council has been waiting on for almost two decades. Um, 
big project for us, um, and it's one that's going to really deliver some uh, serious improvements that are part of the city. I would also ask that we take into account, um, as a result of this, the improvements and the program we've developed put in place for Guja Street, Grove Street, the Chinatown um, precinct as well, to be taken into account, uh, obviously, as part of uh, our discussion moving forward. I really hope um, that we'll get to see this soon. Uh, I think um, Steve and Tom take a good photo of yourself with the hair on your head. I don't think there's going to be much left of it after this is finished. But uh, it's going to be a serious legal project and it's going to be uh, really exciting and important for the city. So look, I commend this to Council and I really look forward that uh, we have a, a good project uh, happily delivered by the next term of Council. Thank you, Councillor Aviad. Councillor Blaney, to sum up. Members, to the floor for the vote. Those in favour? Those against? We carry. Thank you, Members. Members, I take you now on to item 6.4, Adelaide Festival Pontoon. Well, I need to declare a conflict of interest as I sit on the board of the Adelaide Festival. Thank you, Councillor Hander, for bringing that to the attention of your fellow members. Councillor Abiyad, you also had your hand up. Uh, You'd like to move. Are you moving as printed, Councillor Abiyad? Yes, as recommended. Now, members, if I could draw to your attention, please, uh, the a small date change between what is on your screen and what you would have on your printed papers. So I was advised earlier today that the effective date would be 1st of September 2017 through to 30th of April 2019, and I believe in your papers it may have been 30th of, 30th of September. Uh, 2017 through to 30th of April 2019. So that change was made by administration. It was an oversight for which apologies have been given and the correct date is 1st of September. So that's what you're moving, Councillor Abia. Thank you. Thank you. Now your secondary is Councillor Milani. Councillor Abia, would you wish to speak to the matter? Certainly. Councillor Abia, uh, Councillor Milani? Uh, Reserving your right. Members, do I have any debate? Councillor Moran. I foreshadow a motion uh, that um, is the complete removal as soon as possible of the pontoon from the River Torrance, as per the original agreement with the Festival of Arts. You foreshadow based on the outcome of this debate? Uh, no, I foreshadow. I don't think I can. It's a direct negative. Uh, I can debate it though, can't I? Or do uh, I have to preserve that right? You could. You could you can debate for okay. or against the current motion. You've foreshadowed to do something okay. separately. I foreshadowed that I will ask for the uh, current agreement to be honoured. Um, I don't think there's been anybody from our rate base and from broader South Australia that would that has contacted anybody, unless the speaker would have, that supports the retention of this rusting hulk on the Torrens. Our report says how difficult it would be um, to um, actually uh, make it into a cafe because it sits four feet above the ground level. Um, it, seem, it seems now in this state and planning it's easier to say sorry than ask permission. Now it must have been very clear to the festival and it, these are not the festival people that we're talking to now. That is the festival person we were talking to. It must have been very clear at the time that this was very expensive to put in. And I feel a little bit duped. I hope that's not the case, that if it's a choice between a plan and an accident, it was indeed an accident. But I don't think we should go down this route. Obviously, it'll, it'll kick up a little bit of dust for us. So, you know, the, the festival, it wasn't a good venue. It could just have easily been a big tent on the torrent. So we're not actually causing them too much pain. But if we set this precedent and this terrible thing, and you can hear, sort of, it's not ruling out. They're already talking about selling it. You don't sell something for two years. You sell something. I'll buy it. I mean, it's a ten million dollar <coughs> concrete thing. You can build a house on freehold. God, what a position! We will have this fight in two years' time. They will not want to take it out then. It's just as expensive, if not more expensive, in two years than it is to take it out tomorrow. 
So don't fall for the old five card trick. The festival can go and find somewhere else to have their party. We'll all love it, it'll be terrific, and still be on the torrents and we can help. But get them to take it out. If you don't get them to take it out now, it is there forever. It's not a barge, it's resting on the bottom of the torrents. And that, it, is, it, it was ridiculous for us to let it. We were fooled by the gorgeous pictures of the Palais, and if indeed it had looked like that, we probably would have left it there, but it, it looked nothing like that. It was a bad venue. Um, and the agreement was ironclad. I think every councillor at the time said, no, you, you're taking it out at the end. That's all been worked out, hasn't it? Yes, we were assured over and over again, don't be lily-livered, you're not. Get them to take it out. We will get a little bit of hit back through the media, but I don't think we'll get very much at all. Read the letters to the editor, read your emails, read your SMSs. I haven't had one, not one, from a person that said, it sounds fabulous, leave it there. It is impassioned pleas from all around the state, not just our city ratepayers, to get rid of that. It is not fair to leave that there. It's not fair to the people of the city of Adelaide that play by the rules, that, that, that love the city. Don't let them do this. Make them take it out, as per the agreement. Thank you, Councillor Moran. So, members, I've got Councillor Rabiat who moved as printed, seconded by Councillor Milani. Uh, Councillor Moran has spoken against it and foreshadowed. I've got Councillor Antic, uh, Councillor Corbell, Councillor Slama, Councillor Martin, I think, hand up pri just prior, and then Councillor Wilkinson. So, I'm going to now go to Councillor Antic. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, I uh, entirely support that. Can I say it is extremely refreshing to have. Uh, that uh, voice of common sense and strength in the chamber. Uh, uh, quite right, here, here, spot on. We've been dragged into this mess. Uh, we've all sat around looking for other alternatives. At the end of the day, there comes a time uh, when we just have to accept that this has been a debacle. And it is not a debacle about creating. And Councillor Moran is quite right when she says that an extension of time for this project to April to, uh, 2019 will extend, because there is, there is no question about that. This will become uh, and, uh, an endemic feature on our river, uh, on our riverside, and, and it can be dressed up. But uh, there is an old expression that one can't make a silk pose out of a sow's ear, and I think that very much applies to this uh, this project. So, look, I, I, I've run out of patience with this, quite frankly. I too have been contacted multiple times, haven't heard one single person say, "Leave it there; it's looking <coughs> terrific." It actually reminds me, Lord Mayor, of. Uh, my father's home city of Belgrade in former Yugoslavia where people have party boats up and down the river and they rust and they look horrendous. Great city, I might say, but um, uh, the, the river is not well used. This will set a precedent. We'll end up with more of them and then we'll end up with this for 10 years and I don't want it and I don't think the people of Adelaide want it. So I think we should scuttle this. Thank you, Councillor Antic. Councillor Corbell, followed by Councillor Slum. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I too will not be supporting this and um, I will support the foreshadow motion uh, mentioned by Councillor um, Moran. Unfortunately, um, it was made very clear to us originally that it would be a temporary um, structure on the River Torrens for the purpose of um, the festival period, at temporary activation, it would be removed and then it would be put back in. Due to unfortunate circumstances, um, it's so costly to remove it that we can't remove it. Despite the work that's been done, um, it's not. It doesn't look like a platoon, a pontoon, or a floating um, piece of infrastructure. It now looks like a jetty. If we wanted a jetty, then we would have come up with the idea of asking our administration to produce a jetty in the first place. We've already got riverfront activation that's happening on, along the River Torrens. There's a lot of activity that will be happening down there in the future. Um, there's a lot of work that's been undertaken down there at the moment. Um, so I, I just can't support keeping it there. Um, I never wanted it there long term. It was supposed to only be temporary. Thank you, Councillor Corbell. Councillor Slama. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I will speak for this motion, and I'm just going to explain to you why. I've spoken with some of my colleagues against it in the past, and notwithstanding what I call a monumental stuff up in polite terms, um, that. What we've ended up with is nothing but just a massive structure that no one asked for. Now, looking at what's happening in the precinct, if you look at the construction period of the riverbank over the next 12 months, two years, the whole thing is a construction zone, to be honest. And if the festival wants to spend another $130,000 cleaning it up in the next six weeks, 
to make that area look just a little bit better. And I've got to say the pictures look good, what we've seen in the advertiser look great, but um, that, that might just be a temporary, it is two and a half years to go. And yes, it may, it may be another conversation for another council in two and a half years time. Hopefully not, maybe it will be, but I'm happy to to change my thinking about that and, and um, provide indirect assistance, I guess direct assistance to the festival and allow them to to play with this space in the space in the time in in in, a, in, a, in the sense that it will it will do something positive for the area and it also shows a little bit of um, gratitude i guess from this council to say that we're looking at we're not just going to walk away turn our back on something that potentially wasn't the current festival spot so i'm, I'm exercising a leaf of compassion here um, and uh, encourage other councillors to think likewise. <coughs> Councillor Martin, followed by Councillor Wilkinson. Councillor Martin. Yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I acknowledge uh, the, uh, the festival's commitment to uh, dressing up the barge, uh, spending the money, and also that this was not a problem of their making, that it was a previous management. Um, I've got to say, though, that I'm disappointment, uh, disappointed rather, with the, uh, the activation schedule that's being provided to us. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty bland, in fact. It, it seems to suggest that the most frequent activations are the Port Adelaide game day booze up and passive activation. And, and as far as I can tell, uh, and I stand corrected if, if, if it is the case, um, everything else that's in the schedule is already programmed for the riverbank. So uh, that doesn't fill me with confidence, and nor does the reports uh, that uh, there's a, a party interested in purchasing uh, the infrastructure to develop a cafe. In fact, a ratepayer uh, rang me this morning to complain that we were likely to create a maritime disaster of the proportions of the buffalo at Glenelg were we to agree to any kind of activation that uh, involves some kind of outdoor eatery. But look, I, uh, Lord Mayor, I'm, I'm absolutely uncertain about what to do with this. Um, uh, nobody likes to keep the festival. The festival does a wonderful job for the City of Adelaide, and yet the ratepayers are telling me that this is a monstrosity that needs to go. And I can honestly and genuinely say that I will listen to the debate and I will make a decision. But I'm pretty uncertain at this time. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Wilkinson. Um, yeah, this is a difficult one. Um, I think the visuals that were presented to us last time certainly uh, um, softened my resolve when I saw that. But um, you know, what some of my fellow councillors across the room have said have made me sort of think about that. Um, and um, uh, the, uh, the rent that's being put up for it, $1,250 a month, you know, pittance, you know, like if there was some, we'll be giving a windfall basically to the festival, then there's, that, there's not a dividend going back to the rate payers. They could have paid some substantial sort of, um, you know, money's coming back to the back towards the uh, ratepayers to do other good things in the city, but there's nothing. It's just a peppercorn rent of fifteen thousand dollars a year, um, and most of the public think it's an eyesore. It, it's a slightly spruced up one. Um, and but what what really has got me concerned is, you know, just hearing this thing about this entity looking to buy the thing and then set up a thing. I can imagine the political pressure to be put on us in two years' time to leave it in there, there permanently will be enormous. And I may not be in council in two years' time, you never know how elections go, but the, the thought of a future council going weak at the knees, which council often goes weak at the knees when it comes to <laughs> my experience, um, when the pressure comes on to leave it there, that's why that is the reason why um, now, whilst I am on council, I'm, I'm very concerned, you know, that, that, that prospect of another party buying it and, and, and council caving in later like that, and then, then we're stuck with that thing. And then they've sort of spent money on it and put a roof on it and a kitchen and 
it grows and grows and grows and then we're just we're stuck with this um, thing uh, in the prime part of Adelaide. Um, so you know, I've been vacillating on this. I've found it a very, very difficult decision. But I think that latest thing with the prospect of that becoming a permanent thing with it, people wanting to buy it and the pressure being put on to, to make us keep it two years' time, I, I could just see that just being a formidable, a formidable political force, which I don't have confidence the council in two years' time will have the guts to say, kick it out then. So I'm going to actually um, um, uh, not support the motion and, uh, and flag support for the uh, alternative. Thank you, Councillor Augustine. And Councillor Abiyad, you reserved your right when you moved. Well, I didn't think it was going to be contentious, Lord Mayor, but uh, it obviously is. Um, and look, I'm going to be speaking in favour, obviously, of this motion that I moved, and I'll... <coughs> Oh, you're summing up. No, he's not summing up. No, no. 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 Just he reserved his right when he spoke first. So the debate goes on, Councillor Clarehan. Yeah. Councillor Abiyad, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I echo the concern of every single comment that was made by every councillor in this room in relation to this. Um, the facts remain that everything did go wrong, um, that things did fail, um, that, a uh, matter of fact, there was poor planning, uh, poor judgment, poor execution, um, and also uh, poor management of funds around how this will turn out. Um, and this is an admission that we heard at the last council meeting two weeks ago when we as a council collectively made a decision to ask the festival to do two things. We've asked them, so as far as I'm concerned, at the last meeting we have forgiven the festival. Now, if every single councillor has spoken the way they have, be it Councillor Corbell, Councillor Antic, Councillor Moran, that's how you should have spoken at the last meeting. But at the last meeting you all agreed to give the festival something. And the something you gave the festival was very clear. You said, well, we'll give you two weeks to negotiate a lease with our CEO and to come up with a plan and a better design, which they have. Uh, they have. The only difference has been some media aspects around a purchase. This will not be purchased. This will not be subleased. This will be removed in the next two, two and a half years when the festival has finished its program to deliver on the Palais. That's their plan, two and a half years. CEO, there will be no extension of the lease. There will be no assignment of the lease. There will be no sale to any other entity. This is the position that I would expect from councillors that supported it last time to tell our CEO around the lease negotiation. Because all of you that spoke against it gave an opportunity to the festival at the last meeting to present a better design, which they have. A program of activations that, yes, I believe can be improved, and let's give them the opportunity to improve it. This is a city that never talks about celebrating failure. This is an organisation that we anchor our economy on from a social, cultural, arts perspective and economic perspective. They've made a mistake. They've made a mistake. They've told us. They've come here, Lord Mayor, and they've told us that they've made a mistake and they have done everything they can in two weeks to remedy this issue. Now, if this was a backyarder business that was trying to take advantage of our ratepayers and make money, like Councillor Wilkinson's saying, and all of that, I would be exactly on the same page as all the councillors. But this is a cultural festival that attracts many, many thousands of people into our city. We, as um, council elect have a responsibility for those organisations, for the people that visit those events, and to hold true to our word. And our word at the last meeting when we all supported this Lord Mayor was, we'll give them a go, negotiate a lease, better design, better activation plan. That has happened. We can't renege now. We didn't say we support Thank you, Councillor. And members, do I have any further debate? Councillor Clearahan, Councillor Milani. I'll go to Councillor, I'll go to Councillor Clearahan and Councillor Milani. Um, look, I, on this occasion, agree wholeheartedly with everything that Councillor Abiyat has said. We had an opportunity to actually stand strong earlier, but we chose to actually acknowledge that there was an opportunity here for a win-win. Yes, we knew that it wasn't a good scenario, that it eventuated. Yes, there was poor planning, etc. However, we also acknowledged that there was an opportunity to improve the visual amenity of the pontoon and to provide activation. 
and I'm sure there will be many who would like to take advantage of that. It's not the best outcome, it, but it will look much better and it will be activated. It is a ringside seat in what, in what has become a very beautiful um, <coughs> riverbank and setting. However, there is a lot of work going on at the Festival Centre at the moment. There is hoarding everywhere. It is not the end of the world on this occasion for us to actually show some leeway and a little bit of compassion um, and to actually make the best of what has been a bad, a bad move, basically. And I just think that the festival is an icon in our state uh, and we need to be a little bit more sympathetic in terms of our support for it. Everyone makes mistakes and doesn't this council know about that? We're not totally immune ourselves. So I think we look for a win-win on this occasion and I totally agree with the concerns expressed. There is no way that this pontoon should remain after the two-year term. It must be removed. Oh, and we would be very... It will be there, I'll bet you Councillor Moran, Councillor. I, I haven't, my five minutes is not up. I disagree. Councillor. So look, there are concerns and I think that, you know, we are able to, during that time, ensure that this doesn't ever happen again and that this pontoon does not remain after that time. But I think we need to be positive and give the festival an opportunity to make amends. <coughs> Councillor Kerrihan, <coughs> Councillor Maloney, you reserved your right. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, Councillor Moran, please. I'm going to put a bit of pressure on Councillor Martin. I'm in support, I'm in support of the. Um, can I. Um, I'm in support of the motion as it stands. I actually think that, um, uh, as Councillor Wilkinson said, it's about. Um, you think his quote was weak at the knees. I actually think this is a fairly. Um, uh, opportunity for us to turn something negative into a positive and it's quite a bold decision to do so and I think that with the festival being such a key partner and such a significant event in this city um, we should uh, be bold enough to support something going forward. What is critical about this and this is where the reassurance should come in for those that aren't too certain is around the lease agreement and the planning approval. So um, the lease agreement, which the dates are clearly specified in the uh, motion, and it says, and, and, that, and we know that Parkland's lease agreements are robust in the, um, per, um, the regulation that it sets and how those um, leases can be executed. Um, so I have reassurance in that process that we can, through that mechanism, make sure that the, all the concerns around um, uh, purchasing or uh, improper use isn't going to be um, delivered because that's what lease agreements are for and they outline those terms. So I think that this is about us being a, a true partner in a key event in the city. We give this a go and we um, have some faith in the planning approval process and the Lake Parklands lease agreement process. Thank you. Members, before I hand you back to your mover, Councillor Rabiata, I'm going to make some comments if I may, please. Members, my position on the pontoon is well documented. I believe that there was a uh, acceptable uh, mea culpa on behalf of the festival at a previous meeting uh, for circumstances maybe beyond their control. Uh, they inherited these circumstances and they're making the best of them. But I must say, members, the debate tonight when Mr Brookman did start discussing the potentiality of a sale, uh, if there was a sale of that barge, and of course, at the end of 30 April 2018, uh, sorry, 2019, it could be sold, but it would need to be removed. Uh, my support for this, this barge would evaporate immediately if I was any notion whatsoever should it be extended past 30th of April 2019. So, and I hope that's 
understood, Mr. Bookman. You've probably seen the reaction which was solicited by many of my fellow elected members uh, as a result of maybe your uh, deputation this evening. The, I think council in previous debates has afforded some great leniency to work with the festival to deliver a favourable outcome, not only for the festival, but for South Australia. And I think that's an important consideration which we've had. But any consideration that this barge would remain in the water, sold to a third party post 30th of April 2019, in my view, is a bridge way too far. And we would require that surety. That's just not going to happen. You can sell it, but they would remove it, or you would remove it, and they would put it somewhere else. And I think that is what is causing the members a great deal of concern. And that's what I'm reading from you members. So I remain committed to it. My personal view is that we should work with the festival and help you out of a bind. We understand you're in one. We should do that not only for ourselves, we should do that for you, we should do that for South Australia. Councillor Abbey. Um, before I sign up, I've just got a question of administration, if that's okay. Um, CEO, through a lease uh, negotiation arrangement, will there be any clause around an extension? There's always Through you, Mayor. Look, I don't believe we've got any opportunity for an extension provided within the lease. So, as I understand it, the lease is de definite in its, in its time frame. Uh, that's the first question. Second question to you um, Is there a break clause of council if there's any uh, issues or concern or we're unhappy with the quality of things? Can we break that out and request a removal? Can we put that in there? Three will be. We can certainly include that within the lost lease okay. documents. So look, this gives me comfort that if the festival does not deliver on what they promised us, sorry. Uh, I was just going to ask a question before you somewhere else. So I'm happy to allow that. I have another chat. You are, Councillor Aviad? Yeah, if you're happy, I'm happy. Certainly, Councillor Mate, would like to ask a question of administration? Yes, it was uh, uh, one question, but it's now two as a consequence of the uh, question that Councillor Aviad raised. Um, can I ask if there is some kind of break clause in the agreement? Is this something that has been discussed with the festival at this time? And would you think that that might jeopardise any investment that the festival might make in anticipation of having a licence that continues until the end of the festival in 2019? Through Lord Mayor, look, I understand there's been no conversation with regard to break clause. The conditions of the lease would be entirely at the discretion of council and the administration. So it would be something that we would just require. And the second question, I suppose, is uh, directed to the Lord Mayor. Are you satisfied with the activation program that the festival has supplied us with? I, I, I'm, I'm underwhelmed. Councillors, I'm underwhelmed too, but I understand it's also a work in progress. So uh, that's what's been brought back to us within a two week period. But I might refer that to the CEO and Noni for further comment if I could. Please. Yeah, through the Lord, just to confirm, it is absolutely right that at this time, attachment B is an initial collation of activation and programming and that there will be a lot more work done to populate so that list over the next few months should Council agree. So it's just early stages at this time, but we worked on further. So members, do I have any further questions? Otherwise, I'm going back to Council Rabia to sum up. Councillor Aviad, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor. Look, uh, given those questions have been answered, the Council still has the full control and autonomy over the site and controls with the lease, control with the development approval. There's a lot of processes that still need to be undertaken by this Council and by the very capable administration to be able to complete this current process. Now, there needs to be enough protection in our lease, and this is something that Council will have and councillors will have feedback into to make sure that if the festival does not comply with the terms of the arrangement around design aspects, around activation aspects, around treating the site respectfully, around no on-selling, no subleasing, etc., etc., etc. If those terms are not in there, you can press the button and push this off. But I'm... Councillor Moran, please. Councillor Rabia, is summing up. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, just keep that in the back of your mind. At the end of the day, this is a non-for-profit organisation that are trying to focus on delivering our strategic outcomes. Think about it. 
What they are doing as a board, as a committee, as employees, what they are doing are trying to assist the council to deliver on our strategic objectives. Now, along the way, they've made, us, they've made us tough up. They've made us tough Councilor up. please. I will not accept, Lord Mayor, I will not accept comment from anyone that would say we cannot give the benefit of the doubt to a very capable rate payer, to a very capable rate contributor, to a very capable economic developer, social developer in our city, where we can't say to them, you know what? We don't believe you. We've given them two weeks and they've come up with some really good things. They will improve. I can't even plan a they birthday for a nine-year-old. Councillor Moran, please give me the opportunity to sign. They said they'd get rid of it. Councillor Moran, please. Thank you. It's really important that we take everything they've said into account, everything they've promised into account, and we will hold them accountable to that through a planning and a leasing process. So please, I urge members, do not do not vote against this recommendation. It is important that you support this recommendation and give the benefit of the doubt to the festival. Thank you. Members, those in favour? Those against? Division. The motion carries. Division call. Those members <laughs> voting in favour of the motion, please rise. Councillor Milani, Councillor Abiad, Councillor Slammer, Councillor Martin, Councillor Clarehan. Carried in favour, members. <laughs> members, I will take you on to item 6.5. You have a report to note and to note, page 25 of your papers. I've got a move with Councillor Moran. Do I have a seconder, please, members? Regarding cooperation with other councils, seconded by Councillor Slama. Councillor Moran, do you wish to speak to it? No. Councillor Slama, do you wish to speak to it? No. Members, do I have any debate from the floor? Summing up, Councillor Moran? No. Members to the floor, those in favour? Those against? We carry item 6.5. Lord Mayor, we need to get uh, Councillor Hender back. Well spoken, Councillor Malani. Do you want to vote again? No. No, quorum was in place. Members, I will take you on to questions on notice. Item 7, of which we have nil. And I'll wait for Councillor Hender to join us. Thank you, members. Members, I will go to uh, questions without notice. Do I have any questions without notice, members? Councillor Martin. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, the administration has produced a brochure, which I referred to earlier, which has been delivered to ratepayers with their rate demand, noting that the average increase in valuations is of the order of 6.5%. If that flows through to rating increases, what is the average increase for the categories of residential and non-residential or commercial rate payers? See you. Steve Matheson, thanks. Three, Lord Mayor. Um, in relation to the increase that was identified in the rates brochure, that was in relation to the overall valuations, as we discussed earlier, Councillor. Um, the rates revenue increase in the budget was about 3%, which made up of 1.8% from growth and one2 from the existing categories, which resulted in an average rate increase for residential of 3.4% across the average of all of the residential and non-residential of 0.8%. Sorry, could you repeat the last thing? 0.8%. Um, the administration's brochure uh, for ratepayers has extended the offer of a special discretionary rate rebate to ratepayers who have received an increase in the rates of more than 10%. Uh, how many of the rate notice, notices that have gone out are for that, uh, that increase? See ya. Thanks, Lou. Three, Lord Mayor. Um, there are a total of 6,680 rate notices issued with the special discretionary rate rebate, and of these, 3,034 were residential and 3,646 were non-residential. And uh, what 
what numbers were over 10 percent? Is it possible to calculate that? Three or more. I don't actually have that number immediately in front of me. I believe it was in the order of about 7,000, but I would need to take that to confirm that on those. Uh, sorry, I couldn't hear that because uh, I was distracted. You said you'll bring that back? I'll distribute that through an email update to members tomorrow. Thank you. And just finally, how would the proposed policy of the South Australian Parliamentary Liberal Party to apply rate capping impact on the administration's average 6.5% increase and instances of increases greater than 10%? See ya. Three a little bit. Um, just to confirm with that, the 6.5% increase was in relation to valuations, not rate increases. My, just my to confirm mistake. that. Um, in relation to the rate capping, I'm not in a position to have the pure mechanics. So that would obviously be a, an item uh, process that ESCOSA would finalise in relation to how it's applied and the nature. There's a number of different ways that the capping can be applied, whether it's on the gross rate revenue of council as a whole, or whether there's also some capping mechanisms in relation to individual properties. So we would need to see how that applies to actually understand the mechanics and the impact in relation to our rating issue. Thank you. Councillor Martin, very good questions, but I must say would be much better served being on notice in the future, unless that was business critical or time critical? Uh, Lord Mayor, it arose because a ratepayer raised with me this brochure, which I have not seen before, but secondly, I did send the questions to the administration this afternoon at 3 o'clock. Uh, yes, and it was still a question without notice, so just for future reference, if at all possible, uh, a question on notice would provide extra time. I think Mr Matthewson did very well in answering your questions, uh, but extra time he would have been able to answer them more fully. In writing. So, a point for the future. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Now, members, do I have any further questions without notice? I don't see any hands, so I will take you on to motions on notice, item 9.1, page 33 of your papers. Councillor Slama, motion on notice, potential of staging a bicycle race <coughs> racing event. Councillor Slama. Move as printed, Lord Mayor. You've got second a seconder with Councillor Abiyad, who had out straight away, so you Thank can you. commence debate. Thank you, Lord Mayor. In, in the spirit of the uh, providing some economic stimulus into the East End in light of the RA, 10,000 people moving west, uh, the disruption by the tram lines into the into the East End and the construction of such, and as well the the construction of the O-Barn that's been in over the last 12 months. So I think um, I'll recommend this motion to your members and um, as read, done some homework in brainstorming with some of the locals in the East and as to what we could do. And I've come up with the bicycle race and I've distributed um, to you um, an example of what we did in 1989 um, of a race in the East End and there's a map on page three of where it went. I'm not saying it has to be in exactly the same spot but it's a great great illustration of what, what happened back then. Um, and I was reading through it interestingly that uh, Sponsored by the advertiser, actually, um, back then. Um, I see the, there was a family day in Rymel Park involved with it, where there were bands, food, and entertainment, live entertainment. There was a come and try um, family bicycle riding opportunity for people wanting to try ride. It also involved part, it involved part of the national cycling crew to come down from the eastern states. So I say all this with the caveat that. All things that we bring to the East End, it's all about deactivation in times when the East End is quiet. Um, be quite keen to see what administration can come, come up with in areas before Christmas or maybe even after April. Probably don't think we need another event during Mad March in that area that's already well occupied, but there's plenty of times during the year when there's not much happening in there at all. It'll be just, just a great little boost. Again, this is a one-off event and you know, suck and see, see how that goes, see how the community goes with it, see what attendance it gets. Other places in the, that have recently had uh, street races in the cities were Brisbane <coughs> and they've, they've had 400 riders attract up to 3,000 people over the course of one afternoon. Um, so Sydney racing, street racing can provide a bit of culture, an opportunity for the cafes, the restaurants to to um, expand what they're doing, you know, sell some coffees and extend maybe their liquor licensing in, into the into the street and be part of um, a great cultural event, something that is definitely good for the East End. So 
I recommend this motion to your fellow councillors. Thank you, Councillor Slavi. You're seconded by Councillor Abiyad, and I did see Councillor Wilkinson's hand up also. So, Councillor Abiyad, do you wish to speak to it as seconded? Councillor Wilkinson. Certainly. Councillor Wilkinson, do you wish to speak to this matter? Just commend Councillor Slavi on this initiative. Councillor Malani. Just quickly, Lord Mayor, no, no problem with the motion, but one of the things I've noticed when uh, there is a, a fantastic international bike race called the Tour Down Under in the East End, many of the businesses are closed on that particular Sunday. So what I'd like to see if we've got to do something to trigger an initiative to create um, economic um, stimulus in that space, that we actually make sure that they are open. Well said, Councillor Marty. Uh, Councillor Clarehan. Um, Lord Mayor, what, does anyone know when the um, VO barn will be opened in that section of East End? I'm sure we can get an answer from that from administration. Beth. Through you, Lord Mayor, thank you. We understand by the end of this year. Right, so it's not a... It will not be at the end of the year. And yeah. do we know if the government's um, thinking about any formal um, opening day or providing an opportunity for people to walk through the tunnel or other? Uh, through you, Lord Mayor. Um, I, I understand that there will be some announcements around that, but we don't have any, any formal information as yet. That will be coming out from the department when they have plans in place. It may be possible for Council to mm. perhaps work with the government if they could combine the events, make it bigger and better, and give people the opportunity to either walk through the tunnel or go <coughs> through. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clarehan. Councillor Corbell. Um, I um, support this. I think it's wonderful. I really like um, the reference to the historical event um, from 1989 and reading through the document is really interesting. Um, I attended the Fat Tire Festival in June on the long weekend, which is held in Melrose, and that was a family-friendly event around a cycling activity, um, and it, it saw hundreds of people um, flock to that community from interstate as well. I can see the vision after attending that bike festival and tour down under, what this can do for the East End, and completely agree with Councillor Malani, what she said, making sure that um, businesses are open, like on the um, Christmas pageant, we have this event that goes through the city. Do you think it's easy to get a coffee on the day that the Christmas pageant is on in the city? No, because so many businesses, it's outside of their normal trading hours. So hopefully those businesses see this as an opportunity and, um, and cafes and restaurants and retail will be open. Thank you, Councillor Corbell. Members, do I have any further debate? <coughs> Councillor Abiyad, you reserved your rights. Back to Councillor Slama to sum up. Councillor Slama, the floor is yours. I don't have any further hands. Councillor? No. Members, to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? We carry. Thank you, Councillor. Members, item 9.2. Councillor Martin, motion on notice. City of Adelaide rating and revenue streams, page 34. Councillor Martin. Yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, the Comrie report, which was approved by uh, Council two weeks ago, recommends, as the motion here says, that we investigate a vacant land rate relative to other rate differentials. I'll seek a seconder for you to continue on your, your debate. You have one with Councillor Wilkinson. The floor is now yours, Councillor Martin. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Now, the uh, City of Adelaide has already adopted the principle of a rate differential. Uh, it applies in respect of the Rundle Mall levy. That is a rate differential. So we support the principle. And other councils in Australia uh, and South Australia apply rate differentials, and particularly a rate differential on vacant land. The Comrie report notes that 40% of councils in the state apply a vacant, vacant land differential of between 100 and 200%. Um, I don't think that's right, actually. It's 40% of councils who apply a rate differential, and I think the majority of them apply a rate differential of between 100 and 200%. 16% of councils apply a levy of between 200 and 300%. And 7% of councils in South Australia apply a rate differential of 300%. Now, a levy or a rate differential on vacant land is not new. It is a concept that has been widespread across South Australia and the nation. 40% of councils in South Australia apply a rate differential to vacant land. Now, as uh, Mr. Comrie notes, this differential can't be justified 
on the basis that council provides uh, services that equal that greater cost. It's just not the case. Vacant land doesn't generate costs. But what he does say, and this is the, uh, the point that I would ask our administration to address, is that it can be defended on the basis of a policy objective. Um, we have available to us as a council a, a whole bunch of carrots, a huge bunch of carrots in fact, backed up by a, a team of experts and a set of policies that encourage developers to develop. Um, Mr. Comrie says the rate differential could be yet another lever that is a means available to Council to encourage development and he says at section 5 page 227 of the Council papers this lever could be used as a disincentive to holding undeveloped land and therefore more likely to encourage development. Now how high that differential needs to be, uh, how long the land needs to be vacant for, uh, is a matter that I'm asking the administration to go away and have a look at. I'm asking for a report and I want to make it clear to everyone here I am not talking about vacant land, I am talking about long-term vacant land and the criteria for determining that long-term I'll leave to council uh, administration in the context of being able to examine what the policy is in the 40% of councils in South Australia that have that policy and uh, in those councils elsewhere that have the policy. Um, and I also want to make clear by the way Lord Mayor that um, in respect of this I am not talking specifically about 88 O'Connell Street although that would be captured by this kind of policy. I am asking for the administration to provide a report and on the basis of that report Council can decide whether it's a good idea or a bad one. Thank you Councillor Martin. You are seconded by Councillor Wilkinson, then we've got Councillor Moran, Councillor Abiyad, Councillor Maloney. Councillor Wilkinson, the floor is yours. Thank you Lord Mayor. Um, uh, I'm very interested to see what comes of this report. Previously we've been advised that it's not possible to do this, so if, if it actually looks like there is opportunity for us to do this. I have seen a lot of um, very nice buildings in Adelaide prematurely demolished. I can think of one in Hutt Street where there's a two-storey Federation mansion but now there's an open lot car park. I would consider that undeveloped land. I can think of the BEA site in Grove Street where there was um, warehouse buildings on that site that were prematurely clear that now is an eyesore in the city. Um, I can think of a site on Wakefield Street where there was a car park and there's going to be an office in front and that office was never built because now there's a vacant piece of land in front. There's another one in Franklin Street where there's a magnificent um, building uh, demolished and now there's just a gravel forecourt through a car park. It's not a good look for a city. It's not a good look. It looks like a, a loser city these vacant sites. Clearly there are people trying to get ahead of heritage listing by prematurely demolishing some of these buildings which which would should have been listed. But even the BEA site they were not heritage worthy buildings, but vacant sites is not a good look for the city. And anything that we can do to discourage this practice and, and unfortunately we, we still permit this staged stage development approvals where stage one is demolition. <coughs> And then stage two is starting doing the building and I, and I wish we could desist from giving stage one demolition approvals before the people are actually ready to commit to actually doing the development because uh, the corny site included none of these sites would all look fine if they hadn't permanently <coughs> demolished the building if they're not going to go, go ahead and do the site re redevelopment. So um, I uh, commend Councillor Martin in this and, and look forward to seeing what um, what uh, levers um, this presents us to, uh, to try and uh, disincentivise premature clearing of sites and land banking, which is what's happening. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Councillor Moran, followed by Councillor Abiyad. Um, yes, I won't be supporting this, um, although I'm very sympathetic. I can certainly understand where it's coming from. We had been told by the Crown years ago that we weren't allowed to do this, uh, and the rest, uh, but that may be different now, I don't know. The rationale was that rates are charged as taxes to pay for services to um, the rate payer. Now to rate, this is the information we have then, to rate three or four, to rate a vacant property with the sole purpose of speeding up development 
is certainly quite contrary to what taxes and rates are charged for. The Le Cordu site, and let's not be tax too bones about it, we're talking about that, does not cost the council any money. So the, ra the rationale for it doesn't, um, we don't um, service it in any way. Um, so the rationale for asking for higher rates from it just isn't there. Uh, the only rationale for charging higher rates is to force the owner to develop quicker. Now, nobody's more sympathetic than I am, but there are other ways to do that. Um, to punish through rates is not something I'm comfortable with. In Australia, land ownership is sacrosanct. We buy our plot, we build on it, and nobody can tell us what to do as long as we don't break the rules. If you change the law for one development site, you change it for all development sites. That means if I buy a small plot of land for my um, future, for my um, uh, you know, old age, and I decide not to build on it till I can afford to build on it, the council, by changing the rules for the Cornu site, will triple, quadruple, whatever they decide, to rate me, and that's not fair. That will cause me to sell it quickly or develop it quickly before the time. It is an understandable lever to try and investigate. It won't work. Uh, the owner of the Lacornu site can probably pay 10 times the rates he's charged now. Clearly, rates or um, land bank is not a problem for uh, the owner of that site, but it will have a severe impact on small developers and ordinary people. Um, there are other levers, such as um, compulsory acquisition, for ownership by the state government. Uh, I don't believe we have that power, uh, but the state government can compulsorily ca cause Mr Mappus to lease it to us. And I think they're the avenues we should be going down. Nobody really cares in North Adelaide that there's not a five-storey building on there or car parts or anything. They just don't like the derelict look of this blight. If the fence was taken down and the council leased it and then but put a beautiful park there, that would be the solution. We don't need a development there necessarily, we just want to return the blight. But do not do this for one development site, because you do it for everybody. And as I said, land ownership in Australia is sacrosanct. You can't tell your neighbour, your backyard looks like shit, I'm going, to, I'm going to tell the council that you should be quadruple your rates till you fix it up. That's what you're telling Mr. Macris to do, and it's not fair. Thank you, Councillor Mayer. I can't believe I said that. Yes, I'm, <laughs> I, 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 I would always recommend that we use the highest levels of language in this chamber, please. Um, <laughs> Councillor, please. Uh, members, I have now got Councillor Abiyad, followed by Councillor Maloney. Yeah, what, what Councillor Moran said, <laughs> but um, excluding the last few words on it. Uh, look, man, look um, I see where Councillor Martin is coming from, uh, and I think there's also opportunities around vacant lands and other things that we can consider on how we can assist ratepayers to activate them. Uh, at the end of the day, the economic climate, uh, climate, and also um, obviously the capability or the ability of a specific ratepayer to be able to develop um, is really pegged on how many can they sell, can they afford it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think we would have, um, to what Councillor Wilkinson said before, uh, I think some of the things that we can consider around policy and development would be um, to uh, potentially look at um, the demolition aspect of things versus the vacant aspect of things. So I have a big problem when blocks are demolished and they're built, uh, especially when we've got organisations like Renew Adelaide and other businesses in the city that are prepared to sort of activate the site at a lower lease, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So potentially some of the maybe administration can consider this. I'm, I'm happy to support a report on how we could do this, but uh, maybe the administration can also take into account uh, on potentially if someone was to uh, want to put a development application in to demolish, uh, that that would be tied to a two-year clause that they must develop or break ground in those two years or one year, and if they don't do that, then a higher rate sort of comes into strike. Uh, because potentially they've made every single effort to demolish the block that they're proceeding with development, but they chose not to. Things like that, because if we keep, in essence, the um, the, the real estate stock in the city uh, and we don't demolish those buildings, we can activate them with lower rents, 
we can use Renew Adelaide, we can get entrepreneurs to try different things, but I prefer to sort of trigger it through the demolition clause versus uh, dealing with it um, as every vacant block in the city at every single occasion. Um, this might not deal with everything, but it may get some of the developers to think twice about, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't demolish because I don't have my finance in order, or I shouldn't demolish because my plans are not approved yet or something. Uh, but these are some of the things that I'd like us to sort of consider versus sort of an overarching approach to, yep, let's just apply a variable rate on every vacant block in the city, which is not something that's important, um, especially when sometimes uh, it's not within the means uh, of rate payers to be able to develop those blocks. So we're happy to support this for now. Um, let's see how we can sort of bring some information back in to mirror some aspects of this report. But I just want to make it clear, I don't support just rate, um, applying a separate rate on everything vacant in the city. I just want to understand what mechanisms we might be able to have in place to be able to trigger such um, such, such a variable rate. Thank you, Councillor Abiyad. Councillor Mullaney. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Bye, sir. I um, share the sentiments of the last two speakers, um, but um, just to reiterate uh, what Councillor Abiyad just said is not what the motion says. I don't support um, the, um, the stick approach to uh, uh, differential rates on, on high vacant land. Whilst I know it's a problem we have to address, I think there are more carrot um, approaches where we look at how we stimulate demand and we just did the recent rate incentive. Um, so that, that's one good example. Um, this doesn't address the issue that Councillor Wilkins said about around demolition. So um, that, that really is a, a side conversation. But I think the biggest thing, and the, the convincer of Councillor Martin, he said it himself, is that 40% of councils do this, but in my maths correct, 60% don't, which is the majority of local government. So, and we've also actually explored this pathway before and, and had a whole lot of um, reasons around the Local Government Act and how this actually isn't um, actually practical to deliver. Um, so I reiterate, I don't support the stick approach. I, I support us being innovative around finding ways we can trigger demand and support the uh, property sector in the city and at, make our city attractive to invest. Thank you, Councillor. I don't see any further speakers, so I go back to Councillor Martin to sum up. Yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I'm still getting over Councillor Moran defending uh, Mr Macris and the O'Connell Street site. Um, I point out that the carrot approach has worked fantastically. For the past 30 years, we've had a block of dirt, no park, no community housing project, no retail, no nothing. It's a hole in the ground. And it is courtesy of this council not having the levers available to us. This lever already applies in places such as Burnside Council. The neighbouring councils of the City of Adelaide have this lever available to them. And as far as Councillor Moran's assertion that the Lincoln uh, site has cost this council nothing, what other balderdash? It has cost the city economy millions and millions of dollars in lost development opportunity. There is no retail there. There is no residential. And every business in that precinct has suffered for almost three decades because this council has been utterly unable to do anything about it. Now, the stick works. The stick and the carrot in combination work well. It works sufficiently well for our neighbouring councils to have adopted this. And moreover, I, I say to Councillor Milani and others who say this is not a good idea, which is the view of the Property Council, that the Property Council says that their vision for South Australia is a thriving modern economy supporting prosperity, jobs and strong communities. Property represents our physical foundation. It's where we live, where we do businesses, through shops, offices, industrial precincts, hotels and public buildings. Spare me. Why can't we just get off our bums and do something constructive for this city and impose a, a stick that will enable this council to say, we want this as part of the levers available to us so that we can encourage development. Now, one final point. In the speeches that I've heard tonight, there has been this assertion, don't do it, don't do it. It is a wrong step. The step that I'm asking that we take is simply to ask for a report. If the report from the administration says this is a really bad idea, Lord Mayor, 
I'll vote against it. I'm asking for the administration to come back and provide us with the advice that would enable an informed decision, not just a no, 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 no. So I ask members to consider that. Ask for the report, then make your judgment. Don't make the judgment before asking for the report. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Members, those in favour? Those against? Motion carried. Division. <coughs> Members voting in favour of the motion, please rise. Councillor Wilkinson, Councillor Abiyad, Councillor Slammer, Councillor Corbell, Councillor Martin, Councillor Clarehan. Motion carried in favour. Members, thank you. The, we have dealt with items 9.3, 9.4. So, members, I now move to exclude. So, members, I have two items: 12.11 and 12.12. Uh, sorry, the airport, you want a motion, question without notice from Councillor Enton? Has that been dealt with? Yeah, you're right. That's been dealt with, but I can ask, do I have any further motions without notice, members? Oh, sorry, I apologize. Yes, no, it's been dealt with, Councillor. Well, there's a question without notice there, Yeah, I didn't. Yeah. I, I asked three questions. No, I had uh, Councillor Martin asked, I had a question, I, I offered questions without notice to all members, Councillor Rabiard, Councillor Martin asked three. That's correct. So I have no motions without notice, so I will take you to the exclusion. Councillor Marnie, you'd like to move to exclude an item 12.1.1? <coughs> Can I have a seconder, please? Councillor Slama? Uh, Lord Mayor, I'm asking that one of the items not be heard in confidence. Um, it, it, it is 12.1.2. Um, I, I would like well, to... Well, uh, Councillor Martin, I'll just stop you. Yes, I'm going sure. to take a vote, first of all, on 12.1.1. Thank you to the members of the gallery. Uh, those in favour of moving 12.1.1 into confidence, please, members. Those against, we will carry that. Now we go to 12.1.2. I look for a mover. Do I have a seconder, Councillor Moran? Now we need to debate this now. So, Councillor Bellani, do you wish to debate? I'll just, I'll just ask a question of administration around the commercial reason for this confidentiality. I'll refer that to the CEO. Please, reasoning for item 12.1.2 moving into conference. Yes, yeah, Sean McMurray, could you have some assistance? Thank you, through your new Lord Mayor. Well, as detailed in the report, there's um, a proponent uh, proposing significant personal investment in this. Um, it's a commercial opportunity. If the, um, if, if the basis of the opportunity became public before they had a chance to explore all the details, it puts their, their idea at a commercial risk. Well, well uh, with, with respect, um, I... Councillor Martin, I am just, I've got a move with Councillor Milani, I've got a second to a Councillor Moran, so well, we'll get to you. Well, may I speak to that then? It, yep. It's purely, to put it simply, because there are certain categories of reasons as to why we consider something in uh, confidence, and one of those is commercial and confidence, whether the, you know, whether they, you know, good idea or not. That is very simple. In, in this context, when you read the report, there's commercial uh, inconfidence reasons. Thank you. Councillor Moran, do you wish to speak to this? Just to add that I assume the person has given us this information with the complete understanding that it will be kept confidential, and I think that is the reason that we mustn't uh, do that in public. Thank you. Councillor Martin, you wish to debate it? Then I'll go to Councillor Wilkinson. Yes, uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, this, uh, this is a good news story. Uh, we have been through a transparent, we have been through a transparent process. You were just debating the exclusion, not the matter. Just be careful that you don't cross. No, no, I understand, Lord Mayor. I'm not, I'm not going to give the game away. I'm saying that we have been through a transparent process that involves public expressions of interest. We have selected somebody uh, for this process and we are now going to public consultation. Now, it may well be the administration wants to redact a number here or there, but it is a done deal. This is going out to public consultation. That is what we're approving. So, so why, why does this require any kind of confidentiality? <coughs> Councillor Martin, you can vote with it or you can vote against it. Councillor Wilkinson. 
Um, yeah, I just think it is unfortunate. There's been significant things that happening that they, uh, sort of through the way these things transpire that, that um, they don't find out about it until it's too late. Councillor, are you speaking in, uh, uh, for or against? Just for the benefit well, of your members? I'm expressing my reservations about this matter being handled with the conference mm -hmm. and that the uh, puppets are kept in the dark on some of that. Okay, members, I don't have any further debate. Councillor Maney, summing just, up. Just in summing up, I think it's really unfair to say the public are kept being kept in the dark when something is about to be going to public. That's what we <laughs> going to going to public consultation. However, there is a process in place. I just want to be really clear that those that um, are voting against this, it's very easy for you to say, "Oh, the secrecy of council being people keeping people in the dark." There's a process. There's commercial terms around this. We are a mature professional business. We deal with things under legislation that determine these processes, and therefore we should respect that and not put a fear factor out there. You're a secret squirrel. So, members, you now vote. Those in favour of moving this item into confidence. Those in favour. Those against. We move this item into confidence. So, any parties not directly related to this matter, could I please ask you to leave the council chamber? And I thank you kindly for your attendance.
Members, I formally uh, declare the meeting Tuesday the 8th of August 2017 closed at 8.40pm. Thank you very much, members.